We see a boy called Percival running in an open field when he spots a rocky bird in the air. It's a pretty rare sight to see one flying around here, so he calls down to his grandpa who clearly has never skipped arm day to help him catch the bird for dinner. With nothing else at hand, the old man finds a pitchfork and chucks it several stories into the air, effortlessly striking down the bird. As the bird falls off a cliff, Percival isn't about to let that meat slip out of his grasp so easily, so he leaps off the cliff and grabs the bird before catching himself on a rock just in time to avoid falling to his death. After that, they sit down to eat the well-done meat, but in the background, we see some ominous purple magic on the bird which I'm pretty sure is a not good sign. Once done eating, they then head outside for a light sparing match of which, unsurprisingly, Grandpa is the victor after a brief struggle, but Percival takes some pride in knowing that he put up a good fight against him this time. Grandpa leads him to the top of the cliff and shows him the vast expanse of space that extends beyond this island just waiting to be adventured, places to see, things to do, and he may even find the One Piece. However, Percival doesn't really care about any of that and just wishes to continue his daily routine here with Grandpa on this island. That night, as they eat their dinner, Grandpa talks about how Percival's father went out on adventures as soon as he turned 16, but as far as Percival knows, his dad is dead. Still, Grandpa asks if Percival really isn't lonely after all the time he has spent on this remote island, but he is perfectly content because he has Grandpa there with him. Later that night, he can't sleep and wanders outside to look at the stars. He thinks about all the wondrous things that his grandpa had told him about and he is so full of excitement that he can't sit still at all. However, he's still happy with his current life because he has his grandpa with him, so he doesn't want to change that. That right there is a death flag if I've ever seen one. Percival falls asleep and wakes up to find this knight pulling up to the island in his floating boat. The knight was talking about how his rock bird familiar got shot down earlier, so the person he is looking for must be here. And that is when Percival comes up to him and expresses his amazement to see a knight in a flying boat. The knight says he is searching for someone by the name of Varghis and Percival, with no sense of stranger danger, tells him that that's the name of his grandpa, also asking how he knows him. The knight says that he knew Varghis 16 years ago, he was still a holy knight, so he is here for a visit. Percival doesn't question anything he said, why a friend would come for a visit in full battle gear or why grandpa would not mention such a close friend in conversations, so he tells the knight that Grandpa is currently on the other side of the hill making breakfast. So having gotten the information he needed, the knight goes over there to confront Varghese, while he tells Percival that he can play with this flying boat to keep him busy. Percival is elated at first and is having a blast in the boat, but then he slowly realizes that everything that just happened was mad saws, and he basically just told a stranger in a suit of armor and a sword where his grandfather is. It finally dawns on him that he may have just screwed up big time and he runs over to go help his grandpa. Meanwhile, on the other side of the mountain, Varghese was busy cutting up some carrots for breakfast when the knight walks up behind him and points out that he is using the sword that he had used as a holy knight to cut up vegetables now. Varghese recognizes the voice and knows that the knight is not one to spend the first five minutes of a fight talking, so he immediately uses his sword to block the incoming strike, but gets blown back into his house. He remains largely unharmed, so he jumps out and leaps forward to counterattack the knight. Their swords clash, but Varghese is unable to break through the knight's defense, and once an opening is created, the knight uses his power to have Varghis looking like the new Twitter logo and destroy his house for bonus points. Percival had arrived a little too late and just witnessed his grandpa getting carved out, so he yells for the knight to stop. The knight obviously isn't going to stop just because he was asked to and fires a shot at Percival, telling him that he is next in line to die at his hands. Percival grabs one of the rocks that was launched by the blast and throws it at the knight before jumping down. The rock didn't manage to do any damage so Percival tries using a bigger rock this time, but it still does nothing and Percival is now in the direct line of fire for one of those shots. Grandpa comes up behind him and prevents the knight from shooting Percival. He then yells for him to run away while he still has the chance, but Percival doesn't want to leave his beloved grandpa to die here. However, the knight has no intention of letting either of them leave here alive, so as he says this, he cuts Varghese open several more times in an instant and then hits Percival with a blast that I can only describe as overkill. Percival is about to fall back, but with the last of his strength, he tries to punch the knight. However, his little arms aren't going to do much damage, and he coughs up some blood before getting punted backwards and falling in defeat and looks up at the sky as it starts snowing. Varghis asks the knight why he would come here to kill him now of all times, and he explains that there was a prophecy foretold a few days ago, where four knights of the apocalypse would bring about the downfall of the Lord King Arthur. They have no real clues on who the Knights of the Apocalypse might be, so he thought he might as well come here and kill Varghese, you know, just in case. Even if that was his reasoning, he didn't have to kill Percival like that, but he says it was all for the greater good as he leaves. 
Percival gets up and apologizes to his grandpa for being too weak to protect him. But I'm more curious about how his body is still in one piece after that blast that went in, out, and through a mountain behind him. His grandpa tells him that he shouldn't need to protect someone like him and should find someone more deserving. Percival believes that this must be divine punishment for him lying about being satisfied with staying on the island forever and not wanting to go on adventures so to calm him down. Varghese also admits that he was actually really happy when Percival said he was perfectly satisfied with just staying with him here. This gets Percival to smile a bit, but Varghese soon coughs up more blood, reminding him that he doesn't have much time left to live. He has something he wants to say before he passes on. So he tells Percival that the knight's name is Ironside and he is actually Percival's father. This shocks Percival because for one, Varghese had told him that his father died when he was younger and two, what kind of father would slice his own son into four pieces, just in case. This backstory is too long for Grandpa to start explaining right now, so he tells Percival to go and find Ironside if he wants to know the full story. He's sorry, but Percival is going to have to start his new journey alone for the first time. It's going to be tough on him, but Varghese knows he can handle it because he raised Percival to be really tough. The next day, Percival wakes up and looks over at his dead Grandpa, filling him with deep sadness. He buries his body and is left feeling empty inside because his whole world just came crashing down before him. He starts fixing some of the damage done to the house and finds a box underneath a table. In it is a set of new clothes that Varghese had spent several nights sewing for Percival to be able to use on his adventures. A few days pass as Percival has created a monument to his grandpa and is about to leave on his journey. He puts on the helmet and flicks back his cape before tripping on that same cape. Percival begins climbing down the island, but even after an entire day of climbing, he has still made almost no progress at all and can't even see past the clouds. After a little more climbing, he is finally able to see the ground, but in his excitement, he lets go of the cliff and falls to the ground where he finds this creature. He looks up at the creature and thinks about how he has never seen anything like it back on the island. He also introduces himself to it and tells it that he just climbed down from that tall island behind him and is currently looking for a place where other people like can live. However, it doesn't seem to understand a word he just said and begins to walk away from him. Percival keeps following it, so it starts running away from him, eventually leading him to a performing street group. The leader of the group, Cats, throws paper in the air and has them catch on fire while Elva does a trick with a disappearing monkey and a hoop. Cats now wants the last guy to do his trick, but he isn't interested in practicing because there is no one around to see him. However, Percival was watching and was thoroughly amazed by their amazing routine. The others are confused as to where a kid like Percival, could have come from because they are currently in the middle of nowhere, but Percival wants them to do some more magic tricks, so Donnie tries to take advantage of the situation and get Percival to pay them for it. However, having lived his entire life on a single island, Percival has no idea what paying even means. Donnie then says he will take Percival's stuff as payment for doing his trick, so he does the trick and makes Percival float to his utter joy and amazement. But while Percival was busy enjoying himself, Donny had already put the others in the cart and began running away with Percival's stuff. The others tell him that what he just did was pretty messed up and shouldn't leave a kid like that alone in the forest after taking his stuff. Donny realizes that that kind of behavior puts him firmly in the jackass territory, so he's about to turn around, but then Percival shoots past him with great speed after sprinting to catch up to them. Donny apologizes because he realized what he did was wrong, but also because he fears for his life after Percival's great feat of strength. Percival tells them he is looking for someone and asks how he can find that person. He tells them the name of the person he is looking for is Ironside, but they don't know who that could be. They ask why he is looking for this person. So Percival explains that Ironside is his father and also killed his grandpa, so they think he is on a quest for revenge. The group doesn't recognize the name, but they are heading to a village soon, so he might be able to find some information there if he goes with them. Percival asks if the tricks he saw them do before were their performance and tells them that it was amazing and looked just like magic. However, Donnie doesn't like having to do petty magic tricks just to make a living. Katz explains that they are a group of people who have had their dreams of becoming Holy Knights crushed. At the mention of Holy Knights, Percival remembers Ironside mentioning that both he and Percival's grandpa were Holy Knights previously. The others are surprised to hear this because that means he is the son of the Holy Knight. Just then, two people from the village come running up to them and begging for help. Their village is being attacked by a wolf, so they ask Donnie to use his horse to go and call some holy knights. But since he thinks it is just a regular wolf, he believes they should be more than enough to get rid of it by themselves, and in exchange, he will have the villagers give them food and a place to stay for the night. However, upon arrival, he realizes that the wolf is too much for them to handle and hightails it out of there to go call the holy knights. As they are fleeing, Percival jumps out of the cart to deal with the wolf, since there are still people in danger here. 
Dunny thinks it's suicide to go in and fight that thing alone when he is just a kid, but Percival doesn't want to let anyone suffer, so he will make sure to be able to protect them. He takes his stance and yells that he is going to kill and eat the wolf, so he takes out his arrows and fires two shots at it. However, he has got his accuracy stat at negative 100, so his arrows fly back towards him and strike him in the head and pin his cape to the ground. The wolf is about to take the chance to strike Percival, but Dunny steps in to save him. He gets knocked back and hurt, so Percival gets angry and decides to give up on the bow and just use what he's good with his hands. After blocking the wolf's second strike, he jumps up and slaps the instincts and consciousness out of it, leaving everyone amazed and the wolf on the ground. As everyone begins to celebrate that they are safe, we see one of those familiar crests on the wolf, and that creature that met him initially is watching from a nearby cliff. Through a magic crystal, a knight is surprised that Percival was able to defeat one of his familiars, so he will be going in personally next to face him. Dunny is being patched up by cats after the wounds he sustained from protecting Percival, and he asks where Percival went off to being told that he was taken by Elva to the lake to wash up a bit. Elva tells Percival that he acts pretty mature for his age despite such a terrible wound because she still believes that he is a kid, but Percival was too busy looking at her and wondering why something was rising. They get back to the rest of the people in the village and they all want to celebrate with their hero, so they all toast to Percival and he finds the drink to be really delicious. He asks when it is, and is told that is berry juice. Dunny says he would have liked some alcohol, but Elva points out that he is only 16 years old, just like her. Percival hears this and tells them that he is also 16, causing Elva to flush with embarrassment after all she did with Percival in the lake. Anyway, they carry on with the celebration and party a bit, then Percival begins to ask around if anyone has heard of Ironside, but no one seems to know anything about him which begins to frustrate him a lot. He yells at the top of his lungs for Ironside to show himself, but Elva tells him that there is no point in yelling because he isn't here to hear him. However, someone else hears Percival screaming for Ironside and says he knows that name. It is the Black Knight. He comes down from his floating shield and talks about how he only came here to find the kid that killed his familiar, but instead finds that Percival, who was reported to have been killed, is still very much alive. He asks if Varghese managed to survive as well, but unfortunately, Varghese didn't have the levels of plot armor that Percival has and died from his wounds. Katz recognizes that this guy is a holy knight and tries to get him to leave Percival alone, but I mean it's a holy knight so Katz gets backhanded away. The holy knight kind of apologizes for hitting Katz so hard since he only wanted to push him away a little and didn't mean to give him a concussion from it. Percival asks the knight why he knows his grandpa and Ironside. Percival asks the knight why he knows his grandpa and Ironside, so he explains that he is Pelagard, someone who knew both his father and grandfather. If he knows Ironside, then Percival tells him that he has until the count of five to tell him where he is and Pelagard is busy talking about how much he likes Percival for not being scared to face a holy knight. They aren't getting anywhere by talking, so Percival and Pelagard prepare to fight. The crowd is smart and runs away so they don't get caught up in what is definitely going to be a chaotic battle. Percival charges forward and surprises Pelagard because he is coming to him without a weapon. But as Percival lands a kick on him and manages to push him back along with his heavy armor, he is thoroughly impressed by the boy's potential. Percival says that if he wins, then Pelagard will have to tell him where Ironside is, to which he agrees, but as he knocks Percival down, he makes his own conditions where if he wins, then Percival must go with him and train under him to maximize his potential. He then strikes Percival with his mace, but he is able to block the blow and leap forward to strike Pell once more. He then unleashes a flurry of attacks on Pell but gets his head palmed. Pell praises Percival for having the courage to leap into danger to protect the weak and the will to not falter, but he tells him to take the fight seriously and at least use magic if he isn't going to be using a weapon. But Percival says he doesn't have any magic to use, which shocks Pell, but gives him all the more reason to want to train Percival. He starts punching him to get him to admit defeat and come with him to be trained, but Percival still refuses to give up. It's getting punched repeatedly, while all the villagers watch knowing that there is nothing that they can do to stop it, until one boy screams out for Percival to keep fighting and gives him the motivation to unlock his magic power. The knight feels like he was tricked because Percival had told him that he had no magic, but right now, that definitely looks like magic. However, Percival is just as confused as Pell and begins to freak out after he notices the glowing light emanating from his hands. He starts flailing around trying to get rid of it and accidentally hits Pell, knocking him to the ground. Donnie tells Percival that the light must be his magic power which gets him to calm down a bit, and as Pell gets back onto his feet, he speculates on what type of magic it could be. Maybe destruction type or enchanting type, but regardless, now that Percival has magic power of his own, he is able to fight Pell more effectively, and as such, Pell tells him to give it everything he's got. Percival rushes at Pell, and Pell swings his mace, 
creating a fireball aimed straight at Percival. He sees it coming and jumps out of the way to avoid it, but gets his cape caught on fire. The fireball keeps moving around and Pell explains that this is his magic pyre. The fireball he controls continually aims for Percival, and he can do nothing but jump and duck to avoid it, and not get himself roasted. Pell tells him he will never win if all he keeps doing is dodging, so Percival runs up behind him, and as he fires another fireball towards him, he spikes that shit to the ground. However, since Pell controls the flames, he uses his power to redirect the fragments of the fireball and hit Percival with all six of them, setting him ablaze. His magic fire has the property of never going out unless the target is burned to ash or Pell himself wants it to stop, so there is no other option for him aside from surrender. However, despite being engulfed in flames, he still chooses not to surrender to Pell despite his friends telling him he is going to die if he doesn't. He spreads his magic across his entire body to shield himself from the fire. Pell is impressed that even though he only just awakened his magic a minute ago, he is able to control it to such a degree that he can spread it throughout his body, but by now he is already medium rare, so Pell tells him to give up before the damage becomes too severe. However, due to Percival's determination, some of his magic congregates on Pell and forms a mini Percival on his arm and several more around him. They may be tiny, but those things are strong and start holding Pell's arms down, releasing the fire magic. But even with this, Percival has already become well done, so he should be down for the count. However, he starts healing himself with the magic and Pell it is stood there thinking this dude must be hacking. Percival gets up dazed, but otherwise perfectly fine aside from his burnt clothes and Pell is trying to figure out what kind of magic he could possibly possess. It's not any type that he is familiar with, so he believes it must be the elusive hero type magic which only 1 in 10,000 possess. And if that is true, then it is highly likely that he is one of the four knights of the apocalypse that the prophecy foretold, meaning Ironside was correct in his assumption. Pell knows that once the other knights learn of Percival's power, they will surely come after him and try to execute him for being a threat. But he can't let such potential go to waste, so he can't let Percival go on his own. While he is thinking about all this, Percival walks up to him and punches him across the street and onto the ground. Pell praises Percival for his great control over his magic despite being a complete novice, and Percival is really happy with the compliments he is receiving, but since he is still a novice, Pell is not letting him go and starts using half of his power to break free of the mini Percivals. Even if he is talented and has a powerful magic type against a seasoned knight, he could never actually win. Donny knows that to be true, so to say Percival, he uses his levitation magic to make Pell float in the air and tells Percival to run while he still can because there is no way he will be able to handle Pell getting serious. Percival doesn't want to run though since he still needs Pell to tell him where to find Ironside, but before long Pell gets fed up with Donny's interference in his and Percival's fight. So he unleashes more of his power and creates a huge fireball that allows him to escape and also wounds Donny. He wouldn't normally hurt innocent bystanders, but Donnie meddled in an honorable fight with Percival. He approaches them to finally finish the match with Percival. But then that creature that Percival met after descending the island walks in front of them, confusing Pell. It then pulls out a magic spell stone and uses it to teleport them out of the village. The three reappear on top of a dragon's backbone landmark, which is located over 30 miles away from the village they were just at. Percival wants to return there to help the others. But the fox calls him an idiot and tells him that he cannot beat Pell, and besides, Pell only came to the village looking for him. So now that he isn't there anymore, he's not going to care about the rest of the villagers and will likely just leave. Solid point, but Dunny has another point to bring up that a talking fox. The fox tells Percival to follow him, but Percival still needs Pell to tell him where he can find Ironside, however, the fox tells him that Pell likely wouldn't know where Ironside is even though they are part of the same team. Donnie asks who Pell is anyway, and the fox explains that he is a knight that serves under an evil king and is part of a team that was tasked with finding the four knights of the apocalypse and killing them. Donnie's never heard of the knights of the apocalypse, but that makes sense because they don't actually exist yet, but they will soon be formed. The fox was sent back here from the future to find these knights who can oppose the holy knight's power, famine, pestilence, war, and death. And he has finally found one Percival, who is the Death Knight. Back at the Holy Knight's base, there is a meeting to discuss the information they know about the Knights of the Apocalypse when Pell walks in. They have learned that all of the Knights of the Apocalypse must be young boys as of now, and they have gotten some information about what they should look like. One boy with golden magic, one with eyes which hold both holiness and evil, and one with green wing shaped hair. Ironside hears this and realizes that last one must have been referring to Percival. As he leaves, he thinks to himself about how he messed up by not making sure that Percival was dead. Pell shows up behind him and says he had thought Ironside left Percival alive on purpose because he felt guilty killing his own son, but it turns out he just failed due to plot armor. 
Ironside asks why he is talking if the Percival is alive, and he tells him that he knows because he just recently fought Percival. Ironside says he hopes Pell finish him off, but Pell says it would be a waste to let such potential die out so young. This causes a conflict between the two, and Ironside draws his sword, striking Pell, but Pell easily blocks it. He clarifies that it would be better to bring Percival in and train him as one of their holy knights to make sure he doesn't turn into one of the knights of the apocalypse, but Ironside doesn't like that idea because according to the prophecy, Percival is one day going to destroy the world. Meanwhile, Percival has just heard about the prophecy from the fox, but doesn't think it is a big deal because he just has to not destroy the world, pretty simple. The fox says he is free to think whatever he wants, but he just has to come with him, however. Percival says he still needs to go find Ironside, so the fox tells him that he and the other knights are all in Camelot. Donnie doesn't believe him since Camelot was destroyed 16 years ago. Percival thinks the fox must have lied to him, but Fox Sun tells him that it still exists, although it can't be reached by normal means. If he wants to get there, he has to go through the kingdom of Leonis, and Percival is all for it despite Donnie's protests. Donnie finally agrees to go with him since Katz and Elva will probably be fine on their own. So they head to the kingdom of Leonis, which is 200 miles away, with the fox named Sin. As they finally make it off the dragon's backbone, Percival's stomach begins to growl and he gets an idea for a competition to see who can catch the best prey for lunch. Percival takes out his bow and arrow to go hunting, but Dunny remembers what happened last time and takes away the weapons until he can actually learn how to aim. He wanders around the forest and finds a gorge which looks really interesting, so he goes into it. Meanwhile, Dunny is trying to use the bow, and he's not very good, but at least his arrows go in the direction of the target. He misses one of his targets and hits a giant nun praying in the forest. They apologize, but she says it's no big deal since it didn't do much damage. Just then, two fairies come to her and say there's a short human who went into the gorge, and that particular gorge is pretty dangerous because it contains all kinds of monsters. The same monsters that Percival is currently backhanding. After he is done with killing all the monsters, he is pretty proud of himself, but soon hears a scream coming from deeper within the gorge, where this orange guy is imprisoned and about to be experimented on. Percival helps him escape, but makes the mistake of turning his back to the villain and gets injected with some mystery fluid that knocks him out. This guy is bad news, and due to his weird tendencies to experiment on anything that has a pulse and causing the creatures in the gorge to go crazy, he is called the Mad Herbalist, Nasians. Dunny asks if Nasians is really all that bad of a guy, but the fairies are sure of it. They saw his weird behavior with their own eyes while he was in the forest. He had a bunny over his lap and poked it in the ass with a needle, turning it into a monster and who wouldn't be traumatized after witnessing that shit. Knowing what kind of psycho Percival could currently be stuck with, they all hurry to try and find him before anything bad happens and on Percival's end, he is finally woken up from the mystery injection and realizes that he has been tied to a chair with nothing but his underwear on, greatly confusing him. Just then, Nasians comes back in and is surprised to see that Percival had already recovered from the effects of his injection when that tranquilizer should have been strong enough to keep him unconscious for over 10 hours. It works out for him since he still has some things he wants to test out on Percival. Nasians then injects Percival with another mystery liquid and reminds him that he is still only a guinea pig for his experiments here. Nasians says he will return in an hour since the drug should have taken effect by then, but almost immediately, Percival's hair suddenly grows even bigger than it already was. Percival is dismayed since he won't be able to put his helmet on anymore, but Nasians is busy thinking about how he should be able to increase plant growth rate with this. Percival yells at Nasians, accusing him of also doing evil stuff to that fairy that he kidnapped, but Nasians corrects him, saying the fairy was the one who intruded and attacked him first, so it was just self-defense, and if it didn't want to become an experiment guinea pig, then it shouldn't have broken in. Even if that is true, Percival points out that he had blood dripping from his mouth when he first saw him, so he must have bitten the fairy or something, but in reality, Nasians just has a bad habit of biting down on his lip whenever he gets excited. Percival now understands that he isn't necessarily evil, but he needs to be let go because there is a place he needs to go to, and Nasians agrees to let him leave, but only after he is done with his experiment. It needs to be done very precisely, otherwise the backlash could very well kill Percival. However, as soon as he turns around, he finds that Percival has broken free of the ropes that held him and is trying to put on his helmet so he can leave because he still has his own mission to accomplish, but his hair is too big, and the helmet won't fit properly anymore. Nations can't afford to lose such a valuable test subject, so he pulls out two magic swords, promising not to kill Percival, but also fully intent on forcing him to stay here. Percival blocks the strikes and tries to talk to him, saying if he is in trouble, he would be glad to help him resolve it if he knew what the problem was, but Nations sees no reason to accept a stranger's help. All he needs is a guinea pig to test the drug on so that he can save the gorge. 
Percival falls backwards and is at the mercy of Majans. As he is about to win their fight, Percival's helmet flies off his head and strikes him in the face, knocking him back into the table he was working on. The drug he had put so much effort into goes flying across the room and is caught by Percival. He begs Percival not to do anything to the drug and promises to let him go if he returns it, because it is very important. But Percival realizes that Majin still needs to test it out, so he takes a big swig of the mystery potion and falls to the floor, screaming. Majin is shocked that Percival would willingly drink the drug knowing it could possibly kill him. But it turns out, it just gave him an energy boost and has him overflowing with power. Percival runs outside to yell at the top of his lungs, and the others hear this, realizing that he must be fine if he has the energy to yell that loudly. Mations questions Percival as to why he would drink something so dangerous without a second thought, but while he didn't know all the details, he knew Mations was doing it for the sake of saving the gorged, so he wanted to help him out. He asks if the drug had the desired effect, and from all indications, and the fact that Percival still possesses all his limbs, the drug seems to be a success. Mations thanks Percival for his help and introduces himself, before taking a swig of what is left of the drug and dropping to the floor. Dunny and the others come running up to the scene, and is immediately shocked by Percival's new hair. While unconscious, Nation speaks of a man named Ordo, who the fairies explain was a doctor who lived in the gorge. He was there before Nations and Dolores first arrived and was picking ingredients for his medicine, when he was noticed by the fairies there. He told them that he is a medicine doctor and just wants to collect some things to make his medicine, but he also doesn't plan on becoming the enemy of the Lorax and destroy the landscape. So if they ever need medical help, they should feel free to come to him for help. Later on, they find the giant Dolores in the forest after she celebrated from her village, and after that, a baby Nasians. Ordo took Nasians in and raised him as his own, teaching him all about medicine making. But then one day, he disappeared from the gorge altogether with no trace of him to be found. And after that happened, Nasians began all his experiments. Meanwhile, the fairy that Percival had released from Nasians' house plans to destroy the whole forest before Nasians can do anything to save it. And to do that, he is going to use a monster he calls Ordo. Majins finally wakes up from his drug-induced coma and immediately tries to get up saying he needs to spread the drug through the gorge to save it. However, the fairies start throwing stones at him and telling him to leave the gorge forever because they don't want him here. Percival catches these stones and tosses them back at the fairies, yelling that Majins has been working hard trying to save them this entire time, causing them to second-guess their mob actions. Soon after, the thing that Nasians was trying to prevent happens and the gorge is filled with a dense purple fog which causes all the plants and animals in the forest to immediately die as it encroaches. There is no time to spare so Nasians needs to spread the drug now, however. Percival is confused about how he plans to do that because there isn't any more of the drug left and he doesn't have enough time to make a new batch. But this is where Nasians' magic comes in handy. He can create and replicate any drug he has ingested before out of thin air. He warns everyone to cover their mouths before he uses his ability to spread the drug throughout the gorge and return life to the creatures in it. Sin talks to Nations and tells him that the fog didn't only affect the plants and trees, but also the soil itself, leading Nations to believe that the hole in the gorge is playing some kind of role in this mess. And from that hole comes an ugly monster. This abomination shows itself, and it is apparently Ordo, or was Ordo at least. The monster Ordo fires off its breath and covers the forest in more dense fog that causes life to wither away. So Majins runs up to him and begs him to stop because he is hurting the forest. However, the only thing on monster Ordo's mind is the destruction of the gorge, and it grabs Najin's intent on crushing the life out of his low body. However, Dolores comes to the rescue and pulls Najin's out from Ordo's grasp, but gets hit with the poisoned breath, leaving her with the arm in treatment. The fairy returns, and it is clear that he is the one that did this to Ordo, so basically Percival caused a huge chunk of this mess when he let him escape earlier. Nations is distraught that his grandfather was injected with the spinal fluid, but Percival promises to help get him back to normal. But even though that is his intention, there isn't exactly a book on how to fix this, and they don't have a birthfold either, so I don't see how he plans to restore Ordo. Sin tells him he might have to get rid of that fairy if he wants to get Ordo back to his previous state. However, before they can take a crack at it, the fairy gets sniped with an arrow to the forehead and falls to the ground. The others have no idea where that shot came from, but Sin directs their attention to Ordo who collapses as well. They see a holy knight above them and Percival yells for him to identify himself. His name is Talisker and he is the Ember Knight of the Eternal Kingdom. Hearing that he is a holy knight, he realizes that Talisker must be friends with Ironside. Nations yells at him for what he has done to Ordo. So the knight lands on the ground saying he will tell them everything they want to know if they can manage to land even a single hit on him. Sim warns Nations not to fall for such obvious provocation, but it's too late, and he is already in fight mode. 
Talisker notices that Nasians has magic of both an alteration type and enchantment type, which is pretty rare as far as magic users go. Percival says he will fight alongside him, but Nasian says it is too dangerous for him as someone without magic power. Percival just smiles and goes into Dragon Ball's stance to release his magic, but nothing happens. He continues to push, and eventually, a gas comes out. But it wasn't very magical. Nations thanks Percival for wanting to help, but this is something he has to do on his own. Nations rushes towards Talisker, who raises his axe to the sky and summons a storm. Sin warns Nations of the incoming attack as a wall of hailstones come crashing down on him. By every indication, Nations should be dead, but Percival somehow ran in front of him and pushed him back to avoid the hailstones. That's some serious speed right there, but he must have been on cooldown because he does nothing to react to Ordo smacking Nations away from behind. Talisker says it's time to end this and orders Ordo to finish him off, but Percival's speed cooldown must have ended because he makes it just in time to stop the lunch from hitting Majans, but for some reason decided to block it with his head instead of his hands. He isn't going to let Talisker force Ordo to kill Majans after he has spent so much effort protecting this place. Talisker yells for Ordo to finish it, but it seems Percival managed to get through to him as he begins to cry and call out to Majans. Talisker has grown tired of this, and if Ordo isn't going to listen to him, then he will just crush him along with all the others and call down another hailstorm to kill him. However, Percival's speed is back up and running again, so he leaps on top of Ordo and jumps into the air, proceeding to throw hands with a storm. The others are just standing there watching like, damn, this kid is really boxing with a storm. After he is done, Percival lands on the ground bleeding and exhausted, causing him to fall to the ground, but before he lands, Dunny slides in and catches him. Nations questions why he would do something so dangerous. But Percival just wanted to save Ordo so that Nasians will eventually be able to turn him back to normal. And while Nasians still isn't sure how they are going to do that, he trusts Percival's word. Talisker is about to attack again when suddenly, Percival begins to glow with a blinding yellow light as managed to awaken his magic power again. Talisker is shocked because he has never seen magic power like Percival's own and the Nasians are equally shocked. Even though he was in really bad shape just a second ago, he is completely healed and is producing even more magic than when he faced the Black Knight. If Percival's power allows him to heal, and Talisker says he will just crush Percival so badly that there will be nothing left to regenerate from. He calls down a massive hailstorm, and makes it hit exactly where Percival is standing. The hail hits the ground and Talisker is sure that he must have been turned to mince meat by an attack like that, but Percival's magic shields him by absorbing all the stones and afterwards, fires them back at Talisker. He is forced to dodge, and is brought to his knees as Percival walks up and reminds him of the deal he made at the beginning. If he managed to land a hit on Talisker, he has to tell him everything he wants to know and fix Ordo. Talisker yells out in a rage because he is losing and swings his axe at Percival. But the axe doesn't even draw a drop of blood. He swings at him several more times, but Percival is still standing perfectly intact. Talisker praises Percival's defensive capabilities, but he doesn't think he will ever be able to land a hit on him with those bare hands. Never mind, that will do it. Now that Percival has managed to land a hit on Talisker, he demands to know what he did to Ordo that made him like this. He was a kind person who gave medicine to the fairies and took in a stray giant, why does he have to suffer like this? Talisker says that's the problem since saving other beings aside from humans is outrageous. Ah, so he is racist. He says that what King Arthur desires is a world where all the other inferior races have been eliminated and only the pure-blooded humans can live in peace. Talisker had warned Ordo not to aid the other races in the forest, but he didn't listen to the warning and continued to help them, which is why he turned Ordo into a monster. Percival thinks that is the dumbest reason he has ever heard for turning someone into a monster, but Talisker stands firm by his racism. He then uses his magic to control the weather once more and summon lightning upon Percival. The blast is a direct hit, but it does no damage once more as Percival's magic shields him and absorbs the lightning. He runs towards Talisker with the lightning and uses it as his own attack while Talisker has finally recognized him as one of the foretold four knights of the apocalypse. He manages to dodge Percival and thinks this is a good opportunity to make sure that the prophecy does not come to pass by killing Percival. The others go to Percival and tell him that his power seems to take the shape of whatever he imagines, so he should imagine a weapon. But make sure it is not a bow because Percival still sucks at using those. Talisker uses his strongest attack, forming a bird from all the power he has and this creates an image in Percival's mind at the time he cut up a rock bird for dinner. So he forms a knife and gets the others to let him cook. In an instant, the magic bird is sliced up perfectly and ready for seasoning, but before that, Percival launches his knife at Talisker, knocking him into the cliff. Talisker has been defeated, so Sin tells Percival that he can deactivate his magic now, which he tries to do, but Percival doesn't know how. 
Donnie turns around and finds that Dolores is actually alright, but she's black now. Sin explains that she used a skill called Heavy Metal which giants are able to use to protect themselves. Nations is happy to see that she is still alive, but Orno is still a monster right now. Then Sin manages to find a purple stick that was dropped by Talisker before he was defeated by Percival, and as soon as he destroys it, Ordo begins to transform and revert back to his old self. Percival gets up and says he has decided what he is going to do. He got blown away by his father and here, here he had to fight Talisker as well. So he's going to go after the one giving all the orders and beat up the King of Camelot so no one else is hurt. Before they leave, they hear Nasians calling to them from a distance and wait for him to catch up. He says he wants to follow them on their journey. Percival welcomes him with open arms and Nasians is just happy to be a part of a team with the first person he could ever call a friend. In a castle, Ironside is greeted by a man whom he asks how the search has been going. The man apologizes and says he has only gone as far as to find out that the target is located in this city, but he has yet to actually locate it, and it continues to elude them even now. So Caden promises to redouble his search efforts in order to find it. But Anna, the girl standing beside him, can tell that something is terribly wrong with Caden, and even more so with Ironside. Immediately after she thinks this, Ironside begins talking about how beautiful she has gotten since she turned 16, like the creepy uncle everyone forgets to uninvite from the party. And now that she's legal, he would have liked to get her to marry his son if she doesn't mind. She clearly minds, but Caden is sucking up to Ironside so much that he is fully willing to sell his daughter off. She doesn't know what to say, but luckily Ironside was only joking after all, he plans to kill his son, if he ever actually finds him. He also asks her to keep an eye out for the thing he and her father are looking for, called the Fragments of the Coffin of Eternal Darkness. Our boy and his team eventually make it all the way to the village of Sustana. And as soon as they arrive, Percival's magic begins reacting to something, directing him towards the tree with something buried under it. Ignoring the possibility that he may be desecrating someone's grave, Percival digs it up and finds one of those coffin fragments. Sidon seems to know what that is, and so does Anna as she appears behind the group and questions them on why they are here, while also threatening them. She thinks they are here to give that fragment to the Holy Knight, but Donnie tries to explain that they just happened to find this thing. She draws her sword without hearing them out, and Donnie pulls out his knife to defend himself, but gets no diff and is eating a face full of dirt. Nations saw Dunny get annihilated and decided right there that he didn't want to fight her, but she wanted to fight him, so he didn't have a choice, but to get a taste of the ground as well. She then declared that no matter what, she would get them to give back that fragment, and Percival just hands it over. It usually isn't that easy, so she is taken aback, but she still doesn't believe they are innocent. She can see the darkness in people, and while Dunny and Nations don't have much, there is still darkness within them. However, when it comes to Percival, his brain is too smooth to hold any lies, so he is completely clean. So she realizes that he was telling the truth when he said they accidentally dug it up. They ask her who the holy knight she was talking about earlier is, but their conversation is interrupted by a maid who has come to fetch her, since the lord is currently looking for her. She tries to hide the fragment since everyone in town is looking for that thing. She stuffs it in Percival's cloak, asking him to never show it to anyone, otherwise Ironside will get his hands on it. Hearing that name, there is a lot that Percival wants to ask, but he gets cut short as Anna has to go now. The guys get a room in an inn and wonder what the item they have could be since Anna was so worried about keeping it hidden. Sin says he knows what it is, but this is the first time he has ever personally seen one. It's a fragment of the Coffin of Eternal Darkness, a legendary magical item that was created by a giant craftsman long ago. In the castle, Anna's father is trying to persuade her not to go out anymore because it can be really dangerous out there, but she retorts that he lets a mysterious man such as Iron Side move around freely in the city, which is arguably more dangerous. He knows of her ability to see the evil in people, so he is sure that she is right about Ironside being evil, but the dude has the power to level mountains with his fingers, so Caden doesn't want to push his luck by aggravating him. She says he should stop being such a wimp and stand up for the people because she will become a holy knight one day and will surely protect the city if anything happens, but her father has had enough of this conversation and bitch slaps the freedom of speech out of her. He then gets called by the maid informing him that it is time for an arrangement he had planned. He meets with Ironside while Percival and the others watch from a nearby rooftop. Ironside unveils a relic fragment which fits perfectly with the piece that Percival found and Sin can tell that something very bad will happen if he manages to complete that relic. The relic was originally used by the demon tribe, but to activate it, the goddesses had to sacrifice themselves. It was sealed away and he tells them he'll explain in detail later, but right now, the problem is the process to activate it. He assumes Ironside has gathered all the people here to use them as sacrifices to activate it, meaning the entire town would be in danger. Percival wants to leap into action immediately, 
but Sin tells him to calm down since fortunately, the final piece to complete the artifact is still in their hands so he can't activate it. Percival still wants to go because he has been after Ironside this entire time, but with his current ability, he would only put himself and the civilians in danger. Ironside is lying through his teeth, asking the citizens for their cooperation in his plan to complete the ceremony because it will save them. But Anna is not going to sit by and listen to this man lie like a politician during election season. She calls him out, but he tries to play it off like she's mistaken, however. After she states that it is her magic power that allows her to see his lies, he grabs her and is prepared to silence the lie detector. Sin runs back to the inn to secure the piece of the relic while Percival jumps down and distracts Ironside to let him and Anna escape. Ironside fires off one of his crosses, but it narrowly misses them and they flee under the cover of the dust. As Sin and the others return to the inn, they see the maid holding the relic fragment and then turn into this thing before flying away with and handing it over to Ironside. Kate has finally wised up a bit and tries to stop Ironside, but he is too weak, and it's too late as he has combined the pieces. Sin briefs the others on the situation and tells them they need to stop the ritual before Ironside can kill all the people in the city. If they can manage to get even one piece, then it will be their victory. They all agree to help stop the ritual, but Anna can see that Sin is lying about something here. Before they go, Sin reminds Percival not to fight Ironside head-on because he is at least 10 times more powerful than he is now. So they all run off to accomplish their rules while Ironside has begun the ritual. As he does this, Black Boo begins to rise up from the ground and fly off into the city to accept the sacrifice. And once it hits the ground, it soaks in and transforms into a rock monster with a hideous jawline and equally, anything that is touched by the darkness becomes a monster hell-bent on munching on humans. Ironside instructs his familiar, Dorak, to take charge of the monster to make sure that no human makes it out of town alive. Dunny sees all the monsters and is horrified by the carnage he's witnessing. But Percival says it's alright since Sin will come up with a plan to stop Ironside as soon as possible. Anna informs him that with her special power, she can tell that Sin is lying about something to them so she can't understand why he puts so much trust in a random fox he met a week ago. But Percival still wholeheartedly believes in him and it's not like today is the first time he's acted suspiciously. So they just decide to follow Percival's belief. They run through the streets and find Anna's father lying slumped against a wall. She rushes to his side to see if he is still alive and luckily he is just unconscious, so they shift their attention to Ironside who is still maintaining the spell. Without looking back, he addresses Percival and says he was originally planning to kill him here, but he is busy right now, so he doesn't have time to deal with him. He unleashes a wave of power and the bodies of the others betray them as they are scared stiff by the power he is emanating, but Percival is able to maintain his composure and run up to him to strike with a magic hand. However, it does no damage as the magic is dissipated by Ironside before it can hit him. The others can't believe he was able to counter an attack like that without even turning around, but they try to remind Percival that his mission is not to defeat Ironside, it's to stop the ritual. Percival hadn't forgotten, so he used his magic mini people to go after the Coffin of Darkness, but as they tried to break it, they were destroyed by a flash of power. Percival's magic dissipates again, and he is left confused as to why it didn't work. Seeing that Percival went straight for the coffin instead of him, Ironside can tell that his true objective is to stop the ritual, but Percival says he doesn't have to confirm that. Seeing that he might actually be a threat this time, Ironside raises his fingers and begins casting a Nova Cross, and Percival has first-hand experience with what those things can do, so he warns everyone to dodge the strike before it is completed. And it's a good thing he wanted them, because after that strike, the ground is carved up, and that would have otherwise been their bodies. Taking one look at the damage, they can all tell that Ironside is powerful enough to kill them in a single hit. Ironside starts talking about it being disrespectful for Percival to attack his father, but I think he lost the father right back on murder attempt number one. Anna is shocked to hear that Ironside is Percival's father, and from what the others know, he is the one that killed Percival's grandfather, which is why he wants to fight him so badly. Aside from that, Dunny says they need to run away quickly. Ironside is way too dangerous, and with how he acts, even if they were babies, he wouldn't hesitate to kill them all. Matians asks what will happen to the villagers if they just leave, but Dunny has known this village for one day, he sees no reason he should get himself killed for people he has never met before. Nations thinks he is being unreasonable, but Anna kind of agrees with him, thinking this is the town's problem, so she can't ask strangers whom she attacked upon first meeting to sacrifice their lives to save it. This is something she must do on her own. Nations says he is not going to run away and leave them behind. But Dunny can't say the same because he immediately gets stepping and leaves them behind. Percival continues to attack Ironside and says if he can't stop him from doing the ritual, then he is just going to break the coffin altogether. Ironside doesn't think that's a funny joke and fires off several crosses at Percival. 
He manages to dodge them by jumping upward, and asks the other to go after the coffin while he keeps Iron's side busy. But honestly, this is light work for Iron's side, so he isn't losing focus by fighting him at all. As they clash, Ironside uses his sword to cut Percival's magic in two. He then tells him his swordsmanship is pretty good, but it would only work on a bird on a cutting board. He then raises his sword to strike Percival down once and for all, but gets stopped by Anna who is angered to learn Ironside killed his own father, and now wants to kill his son. And Ironside is just annoyed that this girl that keeps pretending to be a holy knight is interfering with his plans again. She continues to attack him and proclaims again that she will become a holy knight that will truly protect the town from evil. All while Ironside parries every one of her attacks without even turning to look. He then asks if she thinks she can fight with her clothes in that state, and soon after, her clothes rip apart. But rather than be embarrassed, she takes her clothes off altogether, revealing that she had a second outfit under her first one. She's paying Percival back for saving her earlier, so she isn't going to back down for any reason. Ironside sees her courage and is impressed, finally turning to face her and saying she should try to land a hit or even just a scratch on him. But soon after he had made his challenge, the nausea effect hits and his body begins to feel numb. This was the work of Nasians as he used his poison magic to weaken Ironside. That's some nice teamwork, but Ironside has grown fed up with their constant tricks and traps, so he is starting to take this whole fight a little more seriously and prepares to show them what true pain is. He throws some glowing red dust into the air and the group just stands there like it isn't a clear indication that this thing is an attack. Even Anna's father was able to realize what was coming, and there was enough time for him to run to his daughter's side, so there really shouldn't have been a reason they couldn't dodge. But in the end, they get hit with the attack as dozens of smaller crosses strike them repeatedly. The aftermath leaves a smoke pillar in the sky and from a rooftop in town, a man watches before heading for the epicenter of the chaos. Meanwhile, Donnie is still running through the streets that are now populated with nightmare fuel. After seeing this monstrosity, he turns to run in the opposite direction, really wanting to get out of this city before he gets his life revoked. With all the chaos happening around him, Dunny hears the screams of a little girl, and when he looks to see the sound's origin, he finds a girl and her mother about to get licked from head to toe, and down to the bone by this monster. As they continue to cry out for help, Dunny has an existential crisis. His intention was to leave the town and never look back, but even he isn't able to turn his back on a crying girl, but with that being said, he has no idea how he is meant to defeat that thing, so he wonders what he is supposed to do. Back at the town center, Anna's father who jumped in front of her had managed to save her from getting injured, and when she asks why he would put himself in harm's way, he says it's only natural for a parent to protect their child. Normally this would be where the old man dies, but luckily, the May Percivals are hard at work healing his wounds, so he'll survive to see another day. The same goes for Nasians, but for Percival himself, the situation is looking far more dire. Ironside is astonished that Percival managed to protect his friends from the Red Crosses, and if this growth rate continues, he could very well become a genuine threat to him, so he needs to finish this now. Percival asks him why he had to go kill his grandpa, but to Ironside, it was just a natural response to the possibility that he could have been one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, so no guilt is felt. Percival doesn't see that as a good reason to pull up and just kill a man, but there is also the fact that Ironside holds a major grudge against Percival's grandfather for taking something he valued greatly long ago. While Ironside is still distracted, Anna swoops in with a sword strike, but gets deflected easily, However, the additional distraction gave Percival enough an opening to try to destroy the coffin. But that too is stopped by Ironside as he throws Percival to the ground. He then stabs him through the hand, again lecturing him about being respectful to his parents. And the others are powerless to do anything but watch as Percival gets tortured. Anna tries to go help him, but Ironside threatens to break her body next time she tries to attack him, stopping her in her tracks out of fear. He then resumes beating Percival into the ground, saying that after he is done massacring the people in this town, he will move on to the city of Leonis and destroy it as well. But before that, he is going to kill Percival to make sure the four knights of the apocalypse can never meet in one place. He sees Percival's magic trying to heal his injured hand, so he stomps it into the ground to stop it from healing and calls Percival's magic pathetic. He raises his sword and stabs Percival through the stomach, while the others plead for him to stop. And as Percival looks up one final time, we see the light fade from his eyes. After that, all of his magic fades away, and Ironside is sure that he is dead this time. He has now taken care of one of the four knights, so all that is left for him to do here is to kill all the people in the town to complete the ritual. Nations, through tears, runs over and pulls Percival's body back. Ironside couldn't care less about those two, so with Percival dead, he turns back to complete his ritual. Nasians can't believe he is dead and tries to give him the medicine he had made to cure the gorge, but being dead, Percival is unable to drink it. Anna steps up and tries to feed him the potion with mouth to mouth, 
but Percival still can't drink it. It's not looking good for the prospects of Percival surviving, but just when all hope was lost, one mini Percival is reformed, indicating that Percival is still alive. Ironside overhears this and is shocked that Percival has somehow managed to come back to life, but it doesn't matter to him since he can simply kill him again. He launches one more red cross, but Nations gets in front of Percival's body to shield him. Due to the poison Nations had used on him earlier, his attacks have grown weaker and more imprecise, which is how Nations survived that deadly hit. Ironside gives him one last chance and tells the boy to leave this place and let Percival die if he wants to get out alive, but Nations isn't budging and will take as many hits as necessary for the sake of Percival. Anna is also going to stand by his side and defend Percival, because she owes him a great amount for all the help he has given her. As she clashes with Ironside again, Percival's magic slowly recovers as more and more of his mini Percival's reform. As Anna continues to fight with Ironside, he is still far stronger than her even in his weakened state, so he manages to give her a haircut in the middle of the battle. But while Ironside was distracted, Percival's magic had returned to full strength and had even grown stronger than it was before. At the same moment, Dunning returns, having realized that he couldn't leave his friends behind to die in a place like this, but the situation doesn't really call for his help as Percival's magic begins to overrun the area. Right now, Ironside is wishing he had double-tapped this kid and tries to do it now, but it's too late as Percival has reawakened with a new understanding of his power. It's not his alone, but for the people who believe in him. Their faith gives him power, and that is the true nature of his magic, hope. Back in the town, the various monsters are still on a rampage under the command of Ironside's familiar, and he instructs them to spare no human. No matter what it takes, they must all die in order to awaken the coffin as Ironside wants. As the mayhem continues, from a nearby alleyway, a man emerges holding several knives, and as one of the citizens is about to get eaten by a monster, it has its body turned to dust in an instant. This was the work of that mysterious man, and after defeating the monster, the knife in his hand shatters to pieces, so he brings out the next one. With these knives, he continues to lay indiscriminate carnage upon the monsters and destroy them before they can tell what's happening. Explosions continue to rain down upon them as the familiar dark is left in utter confusion. Ironside contacts him to ask why the sacrifices haven't been completed yet, but while that's what Derek was doing, he has no explanation to give. All of a sudden, a bunch of the monsters started dying to a mysterious power, but he has no clue what that power it is, who is doing it, or even how many of the attackers there are. He flies down to ask one of the monsters what's going on down here, but as the Titan lowers its head to give an answer, it gets cleaved in two. As the dust settles, he can finally see the person responsible for the monster's death, but the man raises his knife and sends one of his strikes aimed towards Derek. He is unable to dodge and meets the same fate as the monster that perished before him, as well as a chain of monsters that were killed after him. The destruction is so widespread that even from the top of the hill, Percival and the others can tell that someone is bringing down a bunch of the monsters in town. Nations wonders if it's some holy warrior, but while they don't know exactly who it is, they believe it was the work of Sin going to call in reinforcements. With the monsters being killed as they speak, even with the lives that were already lost, Ironside will no longer be able to sacrifice enough people to activate the coffin, so he has lost. Ironside very calmly accepts his loss and briefly goes into proud father mode, telling Percival he has grown so much in such a short amount of time, and his grandfather would definitely be happy to see how powerful he has become. But seeing as he was the one who killed said grandfather, this is one time Percival wishes his father never came back with the milk. Ironside says it was just him fulfilling his duty, so he had to kill his grandfather, and moreover, he tried to kill his own son, Percival twice. He seems to be showing some amount of remorse for his actions and drops his sword to the ground. According to him, for failing his mission to activate the coffin, he will be held accountable by his lord and executed if he returns, but that is what he deserves. This one Adian personality is starting to seem really fishy. He claims to have given up, so he at least wants to see the face of his son up close one last time. Percival was beginning to fall for his talk no jutsu, but luckily, Anna was there to give him a reality check. Every word Ironside just uttered was a lie, and there is no sign of remorse or love anywhere in his heart, so now that the ritual has been stopped, all he wanted to do was to trick Percival into getting close enough to be killed at his hands. Ironside is enraged that Anna ruined his talk no jutsu trap and swears that no matter what, he will make sure Percival meets his end here. He begins rapid firing his crosses at them forcing Percival to fly around through the sky to evade the strikes. He continues to dart through the sky at breakneck speeds, and he is only capable of moving so fast thanks to the hope of his friends, so they are basically the batteries for his magic power. Ironside is still feeling the effects of Majin's poison, so he is unable to continue his barrage of attacks for a while. 
With the opening he is given, Percival turns into a bomber and rains down his magic to cluster bomb Ironside, but that was just a distraction, as it was really just a smokescreen meant to allow them to sneak up from behind him. However, Ironside saw this coming and easily countered the surprise attack. Percival remembers what Sin had told him about Ironside being far stronger than he thinks he is, and it looks like he was right about that. While he is still next to the coffin, they are limited in what they can do, so they need to get him away from it somehow, and Percival has a great idea for what they could do, and it involves Dunny. As they fly back around, Percival charges towards Ironside with his hand raised as though he were going to strike Ironside, but Ironside tells him it's useless because he isn't powerful enough to defeat him. That may be true, but today is a win for Percival since the charge was just a fake out as Dunny had used his magic to make the coffin levitate, and as such, it was beyond the protection of Ironside, allowing Percival to fly up and destroy it with his magic sword. As the coffin crumbles to pieces, they keep a piece of it so it can't be reassembled. The rest of the pieces crash at the feet of Ironside, and you can tell he is pissed off because his helmet cracks open and falls to the ground, revealing his true face to. Ironside begins to mock Percival for having accomplished nothing. So what if he destroyed the coffin and took one of its pieces? That just means all they need to do is kill him and take the coffin piece back in order to continue the plan. So he has solved nothing at all. Even if there are not enough people left in this town to sacrifice, there are still many more cities on the continent and he can sacrifice any one of them for the sake of his goal. The ritual has only been temporarily stopped, so he is going to kill Percival now and stop him from interfering any further in his plans. However, he gets grabbed by another holy knight who tells him he has had his chance, but he's done here. Ironside tells Motlatch to get his hands off him because he is in a really bad mood. Motlatch backs off but tells that Ironside can't handle this alone. He has finally found one of the four knights of the apocalypse, so he would be neglecting his duties if he just let them escape. Besides, they have a bigger problem in the form of the enemy force that destroyed all the monsters in the town. The power that was used is formidable, yet they do not know who did it. Motlatch doesn't know for sure who it was, but he can make a guess. The monsters that Ironside summoned were powerful, yet all of them were killed in an instant. The only person he can think of who would have the kind of power necessary to do something like that would be a legendary hero from one of the Seven Deadly Sins, or at least something similar to that. The team is shocked at the mention of the Seven Deadly Sins, but Motlak continues. If it's actually one of them here, then he's in great danger, and doesn't want to stick around to find out what they'll end up doing, so he wants Ironside to withdraw for now. Before they leave, Ironside locks eyes with Percival one last time while giving him a death stare. They then disappear into a cloud of smoke, and now that they are gone, the group finally return to the ground and collapse out of exhaustion. Anna's father calls out to her, happy to see that she is safe. She runs up and hugs him, equally happy he's alive, but now that she knows he's okay, she rubs it in about her being right about Ironside. Sin then comes back and the guys rush over to ask him who he called to handle those monsters. He lies and says he called in some friends from the forest, but Dunny isn't buying it. However, Percival bought his entire stock as he continued asking what kinds of animals they were. Ironside is giving a report to his lord and is getting made fun of for failing his mission. Even if the one who stopped him was one of the four knights of the apocalypse, he can't imagine what it must feel like to get your ass beat by a kid. He was expecting Ironside to make some excuse about the kid being really powerful, but he has nothing to say he will accept any punishment that Arthur sees fit. Arthur takes him up on that offer and has his hands and feet bound by monsters before his chest is stabbed. Arthur sees the world as being played by the suffering of humans at the hands of other species, so he wants to cleanse the world of all of those undesirables and make a world for only humans. But with the seven deadly sins and the new four knights of the apocalypse, it seems that threats to his perfect plan still exist in the world. And while that is the case, there can never truly be peace for him. All said while Ironside is still getting penetrated violently by the monster. Arthur says he doesn't want any more failures from Ironside as he is expecting great things from him. As the monster retracts its tentacles from Ironside's body, he realizes that he feels much better and Arthur informs him that the penetration was to remove the poison in his system from his last battle. Ironside promises not to disappoint him, but Arthur has another mission in mind for the Holy Knight. In this war, they've been on the back foot for far too long, and they were only able to gain some ground because they snooped into the future using the vision. Ironside asks if he wants him to go steal the vision artifact, but that's not it, it's something much more important than that. He wants Ironside to go wife hunting for him. Back with the group, Anna's father is thanking them for saving their town. Just then, Anna comes over and tells her father that she wants to travel to gain experience and become a holy knight. She realized that her skills were insufficient after Ironside was able to beat her so easily, so she needs to do this. However, her father refuses to let her travel alone, so he asks Percival and the others to take her with them. 
Anna is happy that her father is supporting her dreams and he tells her he will always have her back as he hugs her goodbye. They come up to a forest raised to the power of two. Percival remembers what his grandpa told him about this place, and it is apparently so complicated that if you get lost in there, there is almost no chance of ever getting out. Sin thinks they can use this to their advantage, so he suggests that they lure the holy knights that are chasing them into the forest so they can be dealt with. The rest of the holy knights have begun to close in on the position of Percival and his party, so Pelgar asks if Arthur would like him to go and assist them in taking Percival on. Arthur suggests instead that he join Ironside in the search for his bride, but he doesn't like the idea of doing a search mission. Arthur was only joking and tells Pelgar that he's free to do whatever he likes and he doesn't need to report to him so often, unless of course there is good news to be delivered. Pelbert is dismissed and he goes off skipping towards Percival, excited to see how much more powerful the boy has grown since they last met. Meanwhile, the rest of the Holy Knights have entered the forest, but the device which they were using to track down Percival and the others shows that they have split off into four directions, so they realize that it is a move to split up their forces. They think they are just up against a bunch of kids, so it shouldn't be necessary to attack as a group. Thus they make the fatal error of splitting up. And it was definitely a mistake, because it turns out that those magic signatures that they were detecting weren't even from the group, it was just from a bunch of mini Percivals that they had spread across the forest. As long as they stay inside the ring that Sin created, their magic signatures won't be detected, and as such, the knight will head straight for the mini Percivals instead. While they are in the anti-detection ring, Nations decides to snort some random powder he found in the forest, and it must be good because he ends up biting his lip again out of excitement. Sin tells them to quiet down because it is almost time for their plan to be put into action as one of the holy knights has taken the bait. They all jump down and confront him, but the knight isn't feeling very threatened and proclaims he'll just kill everyone here. He charges forward and knocks both Nations and Anna off the branch, and he's sure they'll die to fall damage once they hit the ground. Next up is Donnie, but what the knight hadn't planned for was the fact that Donnie had floating magic, so he pulls both of them back up, and they all gang up on the knight. Despite their perfectly coordinated attack, the knight doesn't seem to have suffered much damage and thinks Percival is pretty disappointing for someone that his prophecies to destroy the world. Still, he knows when to give credit where it is due since he can recognize that Anna is good with her sword and Nations has good battle senses. But there's not much he can say about Dunny. At least he didn't run away this time. They used the tactic of getting them to split up because they weren't confident in their ability to beat the knights as a group. However, they made a mistake when they challenged him to a fight on narrow tree branches. The knight jumps into the air and begins a volley of blasts that are unavoidable in this situation. Sten yells for Nazans and Percival to use their magic to enchant everyone's weapons, but the knight comes crashing down and splits the branch they were standing on into several pieces. Donny does his best and levitates the pieces so they don't fall to their deaths, but the knight is standing right in front of him, and even though he only delivers a light punch, that looks like it has got to hurt like hell. Percival tries to step in to save his friends, but the knight finds his moves really easy to read and simply strikes him down. Stin tells for Percival to remain calm and use his magic to make everyone fly like he did last time, but that's going to be hard since he is so badly injured. Anna doesn't understand how such weak attacks are able to do that much damage to them, and Nasians thinks it has something to do with the magic attack he did at the beginning. The knight is impressed that he figured it out after such a short amount of time, but yes, it is because of his magic. His magic power causes things to become less durable than they were initially. He then charges at Nasians to do some damage to him as well, but as the punch lands, he isn't shaken even slightly. This is the work of this forest powder he snorted earlier, and it seems to have an effect of greatly boosting the durability of anyone that takes it. He then stretches out his hand and spreads a mist that he recreated from the knight's magic power, so once the knight is hit with it, he too becomes far less durable and is easily knocked out by the Nasians and Percival, leaving him to his fate of fall damage. That's the first knight down, but while they are leaving, Sin asks why Percival chose to save the knights, if he says he doesn't want to kill anyone, no matter how bad they may be. He says that, but I'm pretty sure he killed Taliska back when he met Nasians. Anyway, Sin tells him that they don't have the luxury of giving mercy to their enemies because they are seriously trying to kill him, and they aren't all like Ard who switch teams mid-game. Percival is aware of this, but he still doesn't want to kill anyone, so he just keeps flying. Nasians warns him that if he keeps going at this speed, then he will soon run out of magic altogether, so Sin asks Percival to stop for a moment so he can maintain at least a baseline magic level. However, before they can stop, they begin to sense two other magic signatures in the forest and look back to see a horse riding in the air. That is a magic beast made by Arthur with his magic tool. The two knights believe there is no way that Percival will be able to escape them while they have this majestic beast, 
so one of them begins firing wind magic at the group and Percival is forced to take evasion maneuvers to escape the attackers. His magic power isn't going to last much longer, so they end up being forced to the ground by their attackers. Percival is down for the count, and the drug Majin snorted seems to have had some side effects so he is out as well. However, despite being low on magic, Percival gets back up to face the knights that have come for him. He wants to face them alone, the power of friendship means Donnie and Anna step up to fight for him instead. Donnie would prefer to take on the woman, but Anna beat him to it, and he is now stuck with the big guy. Donnie tries to use his magic to keep the big guy in the air and away from him. But that doesn't work out so well for him as the guy is able to use his magic to blow Donnie back. His magic creates shockwaves, so Donnie can't get close enough to make him float without getting blasted. Meanwhile, Anna is being hit by the Avatar over here and can't find an opening to get close. Sin calls out and tells her to aim for the magic tool the woman is using to summon all the magic, but that's not exactly going to be easy to do. Sin instructs Donnie to make the big guy float again and predictably, the guy uses his shockwave to break free. However, that shockwave also knocked Anna forward and allowed her to get the Avatar staff away from the woman. Now, it's a one-on-one -on -one fight and the woman has nothing but her illusion magic to fight with. Unfortunately for her, Anna isn't fooled and aims straight at the real one. Landing one has to be a kill shot. Meanwhile, Donnie is still running away from the big guy, so he tells Donnie that if he stands and fights fair and square, then he will not use his shockwave magic anymore and hearing that, Donnie agrees to fight head-on. The others think it is suicide to fight head-on like that while only having a knife, but it turns out that Donnie's actually built like that. He is really winning an axe fight with a knife. The others ask why he hasn't done this before if he can fight like that, but he just doesn't like hurting people. After slashing the big guy dozens of times, he begs for him to surrender since he doesn't like doing this, but the big guy has the power to regenerate as well, so a knife won't be enough to kill him. Donnie tries to use his magic again, but the guy keeps breaking free, so Sin steps up to Donnie since he's gotten tired of watching him waste his potential. His magic shouldn't be limited to just making things float, since if he can lift something off the ground, then he can grab a hold of it. Donnie tries it out and is able to freely grab hold of the big guy. So before he can use his shockwave, Donnie chucks him way off into the distance. Donnie has finally caught a W for once and Percival runs up to congratulate him on being able to contribute to the battle. Anna is quick to point out that Donnie only managed to do that because he listened to Sin's advice, and while he'd love to say he did it all by himself, if it weren't for Sin, he would definitely have lost. They are now starting to understand just how great Sin truly is, but the battle isn't over yet as the big guy is back for round two. He swears that he will kill them all, but Dunny isn't scared of him anymore now that he knows the true capabilities of his own magic. However, they forgot that there were more than just two knights in the forest and get caught off guard by one of them who sneaks up behind them. With everyone stuck, he proceeds to take the coffin fragment from Percival and almost one shots him five seconds after appearing on screen. Sin has to sweep his leg to shift the attack and save Percival's life, after which Donnie counters and uses his telekinesis to throw him several feet away. The knight catches himself on a tree and begins slowly walking back towards the group while the others check on Percival, whom we find out has been knocked out cold. They didn't notice when the knights snuck up behind them, so Sin can tell that this guy must be the leader of the knights, Lightning Fiddick. Fiddick picks up two rocks and tosses one at Dunny. Donnie managed to catch it, but that was just a decoy he used to learn the effective radius of Donnie's magic. And now that he knows that, he chucks the other rock at the speed of a bullet right into Donnie's head. Donnie can't use his telekinesis on objects he can't see, like for instance, a rock thrown at the speed of sound. He is bleeding really badly and quite frankly is lucky to be alive and all the while, Fiddick is just casually scolding his subordinates for nearly being taken out by a bunch of losers like these. At first, even though King Arthur ordered it, Fridic was reluctant to kill a bunch of children, so he was at least going to make their deaths quick and painless. But now he's changed his mind. Even that guy from before that Percival chose not to let die is back to fight again, and I bet he's wishing he had double-tapped him when he had the chance. Fridic pulls out a magic orb, and once it is used, the entire night team are brought back to full HP. It was already hard to fight them when they were split up, but now they have to go against all the knights at once. Yeah, they were all ready to call it a day and peace out to the afterlife. The team begins to say their goodbyes to one another and how they wish they could have achieved their dreams, but Percival refuses to give up no matter what. His head is ringing and he's exhausted, but so long as there is breath in his body, he will continue to fight no matter how bad the odds are. His magic begins to return to him and Sin can finally say with certainty that Percival is one of the prophesized knights. Seeing Percival continue to stand against the insurmountable odds reminds the others of the importance of never giving up hope. They've come this far as a group, so even with death staring them down, they put their hope in Percival, giving him more strength. 
and with the combined power of all their hope, he is able to attack the knight and make them take a step back. Percival tries to follow up with another strike, but the impact magic is used to defend the group and as a result he gets knocked back into a tree. But it's alright because he is still conscious, and the others have regained their fighting spirit once more. Fiddick realizes the kids are no longer going to be easy targets to defeat, so instead, he decides to go after their leader and charges forward. Sten yells for everyone to spread out and not let themselves get surrounded, but after the knights stop, they have encircled their target. Not Percival, but rather Sin. If you want to kill something, you have to take out its brain, and in this case, that's Sin who has been giving advice from the sidelines this entire time. Percival tries to get to Sin's side to help him, but Fridic uses another orb to create a cube barrier around them to stop any interference. This entire fight, Sin has been playing the part of a coach who knows his stuff, and the knights find it strange that he knows so much about them. It's only because of him that the kids were able to beat the knights when they fought, and Fridic's instincts are telling him that Sin is going to be troublesome if he is left alone. He gives Sin an offer. If he leaks some valuable information, then Fridic will let him have a quick and painless death. But if not, then he will experience pain that is far worse than testicular torsion. Sin tries to negotiate and also that Fiddick let the kids go free in exchange for the information, but he can't do that since the orders from King Arthur are to eliminate all threats to his plan. He asks once more if Sin would like a painless death or a torturous one, but Sin never planned on giving up in the first place and tells them not to get too full of themselves. Fiddick raises his sword and tries to slash Sin in half, but once the sword hits the ground, Sin disappeared and Elgin had several arrows in his body. The other knights go to check on him, but after that arrow to the head and throat, he's dead. They were planning to kill Sin in a horrible way, so he tells them they have no right to complain if he kills them instead. Fiddick can't believe Sin was able to dodge a point-blank attack like that so easily, so the girl tries to use her magic staff to strike him with wind, but it passes straight through his body and in that same instant, she gets double-tapped. Seeing two of his friends get killed so easily, Dronak is enraged and tries to use his impact magic, but before Fiddick can warn him that they are still in an enclosed space, he already used it. Fiddick gets blown away, but Sin, who is back in his human form, is standing right in front of him. He palm strikes Dronak, causing blood to spew out of his face, and you would think that would be enough to kill him, but Sin still goes for the double tap and punches clean through his stomach. The last one to deal with is Fiddick, and by now he realizes that Sin is not someone to be messed with, so he asks who he really is. And for the first time, we get to see his true identity, Lancelot. The others can't believe that Sin was a human this whole time, however, Fiddick has never heard of the name Lancelot. He finds that strange, since if he is this powerful, then surely at least rumors would start to spread. But it's pretty simple, really. The reason there are no rumors of him anywhere is that his opponent never lived long enough to tell anyone about him. Fiddick has no choice but to try to go for a kill, so he dashes forward and uses his haste magic to speed himself up. With a well-trained body and the power to increase his speed, he has been able to accurately dispatch any target he wants, but right now, just like me on the basketball court, he is hitting nothing but air. Lancelot's reaction speed is just too fast, so Fiddick is getting tossed around easily, much to the amazement of Percival and the others. Lancelot stops embarrassing Fiddick for a moment to ask him some questions about a knight with a star in his helmet and a craftsman called Dubs, but before Fiddick could even answer, Lancelot knew that Fiddick didn't have that info. This is when Fiddick realizes that Lancelot has the power to read minds as well, and upon learning that he cancels the barrier and nopes the hell out of there. He gets back on his horse and tries to escape to Camelot to report what he learned about Lancelot, but Lancelot has a 100% kill rate to maintain so he asks Tadani to lend him his knife for now, and he uses it to launch a strike towards Fiddick. Fiddick tries to shake off the strike, but in the end he gets vaporized without a trace, along with a lot of the forest. Meanwhile, in Camelot, one of Arthur's talismans is destroyed which tells him that some of his knights have just died. He realizes it may be troublesome if the four horsemen of the apocalypse are left to do as they please, but he still needs to find his bride, so he asks Merlin which one he should prioritize. Back with Lancelot, he can read their minds and knows that the others are slightly scared by the level of power he possesses, but Percival, on the other hand, is just glad that he is okay. It was the same as when his grandpa was killed. He was completely powerless to help in any way, and Lancelot is glad Percival cares so much about him. He gives Donny his knife back and says he will compensate him for it when they reach Lioness because the knife's durability has hit zero. Anna has a lot of questions to ask and questions who Lancelot is and why he was pretending to be a fox. She says if he doesn't explain properly, then she can't trust him anymore, but Percival still trusts him. Lancelot decided to explain that he's a messenger of the Kingdom of Lioness who was sent to find the Horsemen of the Apocalypse and guide them to become stronger. And all this is being said while he digs out a grave to bury the bodies. 
The reason he hid his identity and pretended to be a fox was because it would be troublesome if his existence was discovered. As he continues to bury the bodies, the others join in to help, and once they are done, Lancelot plants a seed in the ground as a symbolic gesture to let the knights live on in the forest even though they are dead. With the ability to transform at will and read people's minds, Nasians wonders if Lancelot might be a fairy, but he doesn't know much about himself. Just then, he notices something coming this way, and the knight is revealed to be Pelagard, who had come all this way to see if Percival had gotten any stronger. However, Lancelot doesn't have time to deal with Pelagard right now, so he takes one of those magic teleportation orbs and teleports them all out of there, leaving Pelagard with no one to play with. After teleporting, the group have all arrived at the Lioness Kingdom and are now set to meet the king. As the group makes their way into the city, they are in awe of the sights to be seen, especially Anna who has never left her home village before and is experiencing city life for the first time. Still, she is much better than Percival whose brain has shut off from the overload of information he is getting. Lancelot takes them to the castle and asks to be let in to see the king by the guards, but one of them informs him that the king has gone out to play. I mean, patrol the castle grounds while also playing a little. Lancelot expected as much from the king, but since he isn't here right now, they're just going to have to kill time in the city. But before that, they realize they have no idea where Percival ran off to. Percival is busy frolicking through the city when he accidentally bumps into a man because he wasn't watching where he was going. The bump basically pulverized this guy's spine, but he is nice, so he tells Percival it's fine so he doesn't need to worry about him. However, this is still his fault, so Percival offers to help the man carry his heavy load. Elsewhere, we see a doctor in town who has just helped a woman when he sees Dreyfus walking up to him with the posture of an 80-year-old man. He asks what happened to him, but Dreyfus tells him the pain is actually almost gone now, and it's all thanks to this little guy on his back. Meanwhile, Percival is carrying the boxes for delivery and is trying to recall the location where he is supposed to take them to. When he runs into Meliodas who is still out on his playtime, he finds Percival interesting and asks him what he is up to. So Percival explains what happened and why he is carrying these boxes. The delivery was meant to be for him, but it was taking too long so he came out to see if something went wrong. At the same time, he also notices the artifact on Percival's back, so he asks about it and Percival straight up tells him it's the coffin fragment, intriguing Meliodas even more. They finally make it to Meliodas' store and Percival is shocked because he thought Meliodas was a kid just like him. They head inside, and as thanks for helping him carry his luggage, Meliodas offers him some free pudding. Now, I don't know what's in that pudding Percival just ate, but I want what he's having. Elsewhere in the city, the others are still searching for Percival in the city, but it's hard since the city is so huge. Lancelot says he is going to go search somewhere else in the meantime, so if the others manage to find him, they should wait at the castle gate for him. And on Percival's end, he has just woken up after his acid trip and is surprised when Meliodas calls him by name. He knows all about Percival, his grandpa, and the horseman of the apocalypse, since he is the one Percival came here to meet, the King of Lioness. Percival bursts out into laughter since the King of the Kingdom is short just like him, but Meliodas doesn't mind and welcomes him to the kingdom nonetheless. On a serious note, now that Percival knows that Meliodas is the King of Lioness, he asks why he was brought here, and what the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse are meant to be. Why do Arthur's holy knights keep saying he is going to destroy the world? What kind of person is this King Arthur, and why did his grandpa have to die? Meliodas understands Percival has many questions he would like to have answered, but that will all be explained to him in due time. So first, he asks if he would like to join him for a little walk through the city. On their walk, Meliodas shows Percival the town's drug clinic run by Dreyfus, and just as he says that, both Dreyfus and Hendrix walk out and notice them. They were both holy knight commanders in the past, but more importantly, Hendrix is obsessed with the mini Percival that was applied to Dreyfus back. It works wonders for healing, so if he wants to know how to make more, but Meliodas drags Percival off before he can ask any more questions. Once they get to their destination, Meliodas lays the giant for his help and Percival is happy to see that humans and non-humans are able to live together in peace here. It's been like this ever since the Holy War 16 years ago, but there are still only a few non-human species in the kingdom, though they seem to be getting along with everyone just fine. Percival asks if there are no demons in the kingdom, but no matter how progressive they may be, there are hardly any humans who would be okay with living with demons. Percival doesn't particularly hate demons, especially since he has been to a demon village and knows they can be pretty kind. He even flexes his knowledge of the demon language, but Meliodas is able to speak it as well. Their final stop is the top of a castle with an amazing view. Meliodas points over to a hilltop with a castle on it and tells Percival that it is called Darkmond. After this short tour, Percival understands that the people of Lioness are really happy with their lives, and that may be true for now, 
But Meliodas fears that the peace they enjoy may come to an end in the near future. That brings us back to the reason Meliodas wanted Percival to come here. He wants to ask for his help to ensure that the people of the kingdom can continue to live in peace together. The four horsemen of the apocalypse, including Percival, are meant to save the world, but Percival doesn't think he has the power to do something as important as that. He could never have even made it here if he didn't have the support of all his friends. Besides, from what he knows, he is destined to destroy the world, but he is missing some important context so Meliodas promises to explain everything properly to him. Just then, one of the knights comes to find Meliodas saying he has got some bad news. It has something to do with the prophecy, but Percival wasn't paying any attention and was more interested in the sparkling lights in the sky. Just as Meliodas was about to inform Percival of what happened, he noticed he was gone. Down in an alleyway, Percival was still chasing after the sparkling lights and wondering what they are. A female knight is walking in the opposite direction and sees Percival running towards her, so she warns him that it's dangerous to run without looking where he is going. Unfortunately, or fortunately, Percival didn't hear the warning and ends up with his face sandwiched between the knight's thighs. I don't know how she failed to dodge him, but she is really upset by what Percival has done. So get even with him, she says he should take off his clothes so she can crush his balls. Two others, Xian and Jade, also notice the sparkling lights, but they don't have any idea what could be causing it to happen, but it seems they are reacting to something. Just then, they hear Percival's scream coming from the alley and see Isolde chasing after him with her mace, ready to smash his nuts. So Jade wants to stop her since Percival is just a child with his whole future ahead of him. However, Shun looks closer and notices the coffin fragment which was taken by Arthur on his back, and that leads him to conclude that Percival must be some kind of subordinate of King Arthur, and as such, he decides they should join Isolde to take him down despite Jade's protests. They jump down and Jade makes an effort to find out if Percival is truly evil by asking him personally, however, Chian has no interest in conducting an investigation and just calls him an agent of King Arthur. Since Isol already didn't like him, she immediately believes he is an enemy and is ready to resume the smashing, but Percival tries to explain that he was summoned here by King Meliodas. However, before he can finish explaining, Chian uses his magic to make Percival unable to speak, and then uses his silence as an admission of guilt showing just how scummy Chien is despite technically being part of the good guys. Isol tries to smash Percival again, but he dodges out of the way and tries to defuse the situation. Jade still thinks the reasonable thing to do here would be to capture him and take him into custody for questioning, but Chien had been itching to kill someone all day, so he votes for the lethal auction and Isol still doesn't like Percival, so she is all in for killing him as well. Percival takes out his sword to show them that he is just keeping it safe from King Arthur, but without being able to speak, it is easily misinterpreted as him getting ready to attack, so after all Chan's gaslighting, Jade finally relents and agrees to help them take down Percival. Isolde lunges at Percival and tries to strike him with her mace, but he dodges again and creates some distance. He is finding it hard to breathe and still needs to evade her incessant attacks infused with magic that causes explosions. The noise from the explosions leads to a crowd forming around them, and this is exactly what Jade didn't want to happen. But Chayan doesn't see a problem with it. His attention is directed towards Percival, who is somehow still conscious despite the wind spell he used on him depriving him of air. This old lunges at him once more, but this time, Percival is able to use his magic to block the strike and absorb the explosive magic she had infused into her weapon. His magic also scares the wind spirit so much that it goes into hiding and allows Percival to recover his voice and breathe. Then the mini Percival that absorbed Isol's magic begins floating towards her and ends up exploding, blowing her back in the process. Percival finally gets a chance to speak and ask them what he did to deserve them trying to murder him like this. But before he can explain that he was brought here by Meliodas, he gets the lights turned out on him. This is the magic of Jade which makes everything pitch black, but it only affects the target, so Percival is a sitting duck waiting to be slaughtered at this point. Luckily, before Jade can kill him, a barrel is launched in his direction as the others had heard the commotion and came to check things out, so they break up the fight and ask if Percival is alright. The knights immediately assume all the kids must be working for Arthur, so Chayan reactivates the wind spell and takes her breath away while Isolde wastes no time in beating up the kids. She is really proud of herself too, but after realizing his friends have been wounded, Percival is done playing games and is ready to end these fools. But before that can happen, the knight's captain, Tristan, shows up to handle the situation. Meliodas is still busy looking for Percival as the guards apologize for losing sight of him so soon. He's not angry about it as he can't change what has happened, but another guard asks if he would like to call a meeting in the castle because of the matter. He thinks it would be better to not make a fuss over the situation, so he'll leave things for Lancelot to handle. 
Soon after, he gets informed that the former king wishes to speak with him, so he goes to meet with Valtra. We see him talk to an old man who says he just had another dream involving the four horsemen of the apocalypse. There is chaos everywhere, but the horsemen came together to fight. However, an assassination attempt will be carried out on them, and it will come from someone who is a trusted ally. Back with Percival and the knights that were attacking him, the Captain Tristan had just arrived on the scene, so they all stopped what they were doing and greeted him. He asks for an explanation as to why they are beating up a bunch of kids in the streets, so Kyan tells him that he believes these kids are King Arthur's Knights of Chaos, so they must be killed immediately. Tristan doesn't believe that to be the case, especially since they show no signs of them being evil. He realizes Keon is using his magic to stop them from breathing, so he tells him to undo it immediately, and after a few seconds he does as he is commanded. The others are finally able to breathe again. So Tristan begins lecturing his knights about using excessive amounts of force when they have no real evidence, but Isolde says Percival is with a coffin fragment, so he must be evil. Tristan corrects her assumption and says a few days ago, they got a report saying a fragment of the coffin had been retrieved by allies and was now in their care, so these guys messed up really bad. However, Kayan doesn't feel very remorseful as he mockingly puts his hand on Percival's shoulder and says he is lucky he wasn't killed before Tristan got there, but he'll make sure to finish him off next time. Meanwhile, Percival has gone off the deep end after having all his friends mortally wounded right in front of him, so just because Tristan stopped them from fighting doesn't mean he's forgiven them. He grabs Kian's arm and proceeds to break it as Kian screams out in agony, and by the time Percival lets go, his arm now looks like this. Which is well deserved since it's Kian. Isolde realizes this is Percival's doing, but thinks it might just be because he thinks he is still under attack, so she asks Jade to undo the darkness around his head so they can talk. However, before he can do so, Percival appears in front of him and grabs his throat. Tristan manages to kick Percival away before he could kill Jade, and tells him not to remove the darkness for now because they still aren't sure what Percival's ability is or if he will stop attacking once he can see again. He leaps up after him and tries to ask him about his identity, but Percival is speaking in an unknown language so he can't get an answer from him. Tristan uses one of his starlight attacks which would only do damage if he were a demon, but it has no real effect on him so he rules out that possibility. A second later, Percival headbutts him and sends him flying. So Tristan is forced to pull out his swords and strike him down. Percival crashes back down to the ground, but he is still standing and ready to continue the fight. Tristan is about to re-engage, but then Percival's friends get in front of him for protection. Percival is a dear friend to them, so if they want to hurt him, they'll have to get past the three of them. Tristan warns the kids to get away from Percival, because it could be dangerous next to him, but they aren't worried because Percival is always going to be the same Percival they care for, and nothing will ever change that. They hug him to let him know they are still alive and there for him and knowing that his friends are safe, Percival is finally able to calm down. Now that things have settled down, Dunny yells at the knights that Percival is one of the four horsemen and was summoned by the King of Lioness himself, so now they realize they have really messed up and Kyan is upset that he wasn't able to successfully assassinate him before the others found out about his identity. Tristan orders Jade to undo the darkness that he had placed on Percival, and once he does, Percival is finally able to see his friends' faces once more. He is glad everyone is alright, but they are not actually alright at all. They got severe internal bleeding and fall over immediately after. Percival tries to heal him, but his magic doesn't work anymore as he needs to have the hope of his friends in order to use it. Since he can't heal him himself, Tristan offers to do it since his subordinates caused this mess to begin with. Percival thanks Tristan for healing his friends, also noticing that his eyes have changed color from when he first got here. Isolde explains that Tristan has goddess blood flowing through his veins, which is why he is able to heal all wounds no matter how grave. However, he can't fix torn clothing though. Jade gets his attention and asks him to come over so he can heal Kian's hand, but as he tries to fix him up, his magic fails to undo the damage. His magic is ineffective against diseases or curses, so he says they are probably going to have to consult some other healers in the kingdom. In other words, Kyan is stuck like that for now. He is freaking out over his list arm and can't believe he is stuck like this for the rest of his life. How will he keep his position as knight with only one good arm? So he starts yelling at Percival for crippling him. The others yell back that it's his own fault for trying to get Percival set up to be killed, but Percival doesn't really hold a grudge anymore and since it was apparently his fault that Kian's hand ended up all wrinkly and his friends were already healed, he walks up to Kian and grabs him to begin trying to recover his arm. Percival is successfully able to restore Kian's arm, which surprises Tristan as he doesn't understand how Percival could manage to pull it off when he couldn't do it. Percival doesn't really understand how it works either, but it stands to reason that if he caused something to happen, then he would be able to undo it as well. 
Kian is glad that he has his arm back, but while he is still making sure it's really all right, Tristan tells him to get up and apologize to Percival and his friends for what he put them through. So he does exactly that, although it is very clearly insincere as he calls what he did a little misunderstanding. Dunny is pissed, but Percival accepts the apology, although he isn't exactly sure it was a misunderstanding. However, Tristan on the other hand is having none of that misunderstanding BS. He knows for a fact that Kaya knows all about the prophecy of the Four Horsemen, and the exact characteristics that Percival was described with. The green hair is pretty hard to mistake when you look at it. And another thing is that he also knew about the report that allies had recaptured the coffin fragment, so it makes no sense that he didn't mention that at all. He tries to play it off by saying he made an assumption because Isolde was chasing Percival and because of that he panicked. But remember, Anna is able to literally see lies, so she knows what he's saying is military-grade cap. Speaking of which, Tristan asks Isolde why she was chasing Percival in the first place, which is when she remembers Percival's face was buried deep in her thighs, but she wanted to reserve that for Tristan someday, so she runs away in shame. He doesn't really get what she meant by that, but moving on, he wants to formally introduce himself to Percival. His name is Tristan Leonis, and he is also one of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. He is the prince of the kingdom, and with Percival here, they are only missing one of the four horsemen now. Percival doesn't understand what he means because there are supposed to be two others, so Tristan points out that the third horseman is the one who brought them here. Lancelot. Just then, Lancelot comes walking up and Percival is still shocked that he is the third horseman. But then he tells them that the fourth horseman was found already, although he ran away a while ago. Both Percival and Tristan are shocked to hear that the fourth ran away, but Lancelot doesn't know why he ran. All he knows is that the king asked for his cooperation in finding him, as well as Tristan, but he was busy here, doing who knows what. In any case, they have got to catch him before he can escape the kingdom, so he says they need to cover all the gates of the kingdom. Tristan's team will handle the west gate while Percival's team can handle the eastern gate while he will take care of the south one by himself. He asks Tristan to give him any information he has on the four horsemen, but Kian says that won't be necessary since they would probably be able to capture him regardless. However, Cannon's opinion means nothing, so Tristan goes on to describe the fourth. His name is Gawain and he is a tall knight wearing white and gold armor. They don't know anything about his hair color or what he looks like because he never took his armor off while he was coming here. Lancelot reads Tristan's mind and knows there is something he is leaving out, so Tristan finally mentions that Gawain is actually related to King Arthur. This causes a change in the atmosphere since that would mean Gawain could be an enemy, and this is the exact thing Tristan wanted to avoid by not telling everyone. Still, if it's true, Lancelot thinks it is worth telling everyone about it because no matter what, the four horsemen will never change. They all spread out to begin searching the city streets, but it seems like it would be pretty noticeable if a tall knight in full white and gold armor came walking through this place. But more importantly, they are thinking about the fact Gawain is related to King Arthur, so they may find it hard to trust him fully, even if he is one of the four horsemen. However, Percival doesn't think of it that way since his father is one of King Arthur's subordinates, but he is one of the four horsemen as well. Since they got to Lioness, they have been learning new things way too fast. First, they find out that the prince is one of the horsemen, as well as Lancelot. They continue walking through town and Anne warns the others about Kian because they couldn't tell. Something is off about that guy. He knew exactly who Percival was and despite that, he still tricked the other knights into attacking and trying to kill him. Just then it starts raining and we get a call back to the prophecy Vulture had earlier. When the rain starts with distant thunder, all the horsemen will be gathered in the same spot but an assassin of chaos and a blade of betrayal will strike and all hope will be lost. On Lancelot's end, he was out watching to see if he can spot Gawain, when all of a sudden, a little girl shows up and asks him why he is sitting in the rain like that. Lancelot doesn't take her seriously and says she should go home, but as he says this, she says the exact words he used before he actually said them. He starts wondering if she can read his mind, but she tells him she doesn't have that kind of power. He asks who she is, and I don't even know how to explain what just happened, as this girl proclaims that she is his lover and kisses him right then and there. Lancelot tries to get her off him because this isn't legal, but she argues that age is just a number, so it doesn't matter. The girl starts teasing him for never having kissed anyone before, but he states that he receives kisses all the time. But then again, those were forehead kisses from his master, so it doesn't count, and that won her to soul. It's almost as if she can read his mind, but she just knows a lot about him, like his father's habits and other things. Lancelot gets serious and asks who this girl really is. He doesn't care about his father's habits, but he warns her not to tell anyone about his master. This is the first time they've met and she has already stolen his first kiss as well. Before the conversation can go any further, the maid in charge of keeping an eye on her shows up and calls her over. 
It looks like their time is up, so she starts walking away, but before she leaves, Lancelot asks her for her name, which she reveals to be Genevieve. She will be in Lioness until tomorrow, however, before she goes, she lets Lancelot know that he will be meeting the person he is looking for very soon. Over with Tristan's group, Kyan is starting to question if this whole Four Horsemen thing is really true. The others are shocked when he says this because that is him basically saying the king is a liar and the prophecy is wrong. He clarifies that he didn't mean that, but when it comes to Lancelot and Percival, who are both nobodies from the middle of nowhere, he can't stand the thought of them being the saviors of the world. Tristan speaks up and says Lancelot is an amazing person, and even when compared to him, Lancelot's abilities and skills are superior to anything Tristan could pull off. The others don't believe it, but the same thing could be true with Percival being stronger as well, however, Tristan can't be sure since he doesn't know anything about Percival's identity, but it's obvious that Percival must be strong from that unknown power he has. Catan doesn't look very interested in what he is saying and his attention gets drawn away when he sees Gawain walking in a tower above them. Tristan doesn't notice this and tells everyone to focus on finding Gawain, so he and Jade move forward while Kyan breaks off from the group without saying anything. Jade is complaining to Tristan that it is taking too long to search by themselves, so it would have been better if they called for backup to make things go quicker. Tristan explains that the reason they didn't do that was because his father said it might cause a state of panic if everyone knew a horseman ran away. The two continue to walk without realizing Kyan is gone and come across another knight, Perio. Tristan greets him warmly as he asks when the prince returned to the capital. It hasn't been long since Tristan got back, but there are more pressing matters at hand, so Tristan asks him if he has seen a knight in white armor pass by recently. Perio hasn't seen anyone that matches that description lately, but he'll let Tristan know if anything comes up. He turns to Jade and tells him that since he is the only other knight with the prince today, he should make sure to guard him well, but he doesn't know what he is talking about since Kyam should have been with them. Meanwhile, Percival's team is searching through the city for Gawain, but while there are certainly many knights in armor, none of them match the description of Gawain. From what they are seeing, Lioness is really a country with a lot of holy knights, so searching for a suit of armor probably isn't going to get them far when it comes to finding Gawain. So with that being the case, they might have to try to find him using the other clue they were given, which is the fact that he has golden magic. Percival isn't sure what golden magic is meant to be, but he suddenly feels a surge through his body as something incredibly scary has just shown up. The others can feel it too and are frozen in their tracks, while Tristan and Jade are equally stunned by the murderous intent being emitted. Jade asks if that might have something to do with Gawain, but Tristan doesn't think so and suggests that hurry to find Kian before they do anything else. Even Lancelot notices something is wrong, so he leaps down from the roof and transforms himself into a fox so he can get a better look at the situation on the ground. In the middle of town, a man is eating heartily and having a good time, but he managed to draw the attention of Perio and the guards who ask him what his business in Lioness is. Perio doesn't recognize him at all, so he knows he isn't some from the city, but the man tells him that he is here to find something, but that answer isn't good enough for Perio as he is the head of security for country and as such, he is in charge of investigating suspicious people and right now, the guy is looking really suspicious. The man only laughs at Perio's accusations, so the people around think it is just a random drunk getting in trouble with the guards. Perio tells the man that he may not have realized it, but his murderous and intent can be felt for miles, so he knows for a fact that he is up to no good in this country. But the man is fine with getting confronted now, as it will speed things along for him. He challenges Perio to a fight, and he doesn't back down. The people can't believe they are about to witness a fight between a holy knight and a drunkard, but they clear the area so they don't get caught in it. Since the man doesn't have a weapon, Perio decides to lay aside his own for the sake of his honor as a knight, and the two get into stands for their battle. The fight begins and Perio seems to be on the upper foot as he manages to land some punches on the man's face, but the man continues to smile as he believes the fight is only getting started and Perio looks down to discover that his hands have been engulfed in flames. At the same time, Kiem pulls up on the knight in white armor like a stalker and uses his spirits to take away his breath and trap him in constructs made of rock. He doesn't believe in the prophecies that they were told and rather thinks Gawain is a pitiful excuse for a knight of prophecy with how easy it was to trap him like this. Right now there are no witnesses, so even if he dies there will be no one to mourn him. Kyan jumps down from his perch and mocks Gawain for being so weak despite having the title of a savior, and with such a sorry excuse of a man as him, the world would be better off if he took his place and became a knight of prophecy. He proceeds to instruct his golem to crush Gawain and bury him alive so no one will ever find the evidence of him, but his plans are foiled when Tristan arrives and puts a stop to his actions. Kyan goes pale at the realization that Tristan now knows what he was trying to do, but he already had his suspicions of Kyan when Anna mentioned that she could tell he was lying about his attack on Percival being an accident, but this is going way too far. 
It's a shame he had to stoop so low, but he'll be dealt with later as for now, Tristan has to take care of Gawain. He orders Kian to undo the wind spirit magic so Gawain can breathe again. And once that is done, Tristan heals him. The man in the suit immediately takes off his helmet and thanks Tristan for saving his life, but hold up a minute, this guy is way too ugly to be a member of the main cast, so something must be wrong here. Tristan calls him by the name Gawain, but the guy is confused because his name is actually Tantalum. He just found this suit of armor laying on the ground after the guy who was wearing it before discarded it, so he wanted to try it on since it is great a drip. But if this schmuck has his armor, then where is Gawain? We cut back to the fight between Perio and the man as Perio goes on the defensive after realizing the man's body will burn whatever touches it. He tries to use a table to block, but the punch destroys it and has the table catch fire. The man tells Perio that he is going to have to try harder than that to beat him, but Perio could say the same since he knows the man hasn't gotten serious yet. He assumes the man must be some sort of famous holy knight, so he asks which country he is from, however the man doesn't want to talk about it since if he gives that information, then he may have to actually kill him. Just then, Percival and the others arrive at the scene and Percival thinks the man out as the fourth knight of prophecy Gawain. The others can't believe he is actually the fourth knight, but the man looks way too happy to see Percival and calls him by name. Percival asks how he knows his name, and they don't recognize him at first, but after a little reminder, Percival realizes that the man is actually Pelagard. He asks why he is here in Lioness, so Pelagard explains that he is here because he followed Percival from the forest and ended up in the city. Perio tries to get Percival to leave since he thinks he is just a regular kid, but Pelagard tells him it's fine if he stays since he has something he wants to do to him. He explains that Percival is one of the four horsemen, which surprises Perio, but that also leaves more questions since someone like him shouldn't have information like that. But the reason he knows about it is because he is a knight of King Arthur, and after hearing this, Perio no longer cares about honor and chooses to draw his sword. Pelagard welcomes the challenge and walks over to his table to retrieve his gear. So once he is suited back up, Perio stands ready to fight him. Percival wants to help Perio fight, but Perio tells him it's fine since his duty is to protect the four horsemen. Elsewhere, a woman was walking through the towers when she comes across Isold, who is just about ready to end it all by jumping from the side of the tower. There is no meaning to life anymore if Tristan was not the first person to sandwich his face in her thighs. But before she goes through with it, the woman calls out to her and asks if she is alright. Isol doesn't want to talk about it, but after some persuasive words from the woman, she opens up and says she is troubled because people don't find her attractive. She has super strength and is six feet tall, so she just got dumped by the man she loves. And just so you know, none of this actually happened. She was just overthinking things with Tristan. The woman tries to comfort her since she herself is built like Shaquille O'Neal. But their conversation is cut short as Isol hears the commotion in town from the fight with Pelagard. The knights are struggling against him, but Perio manages to land a strike on him. After that, Pelagard finds that his body does the opposite of what he wants it to do, and this is all part of Perio's magic power. While he is struggling to move, Perio orders his knights to attack, but he is still able to use his magic power so he uses that to blow them away. The blast can be seen all through the kingdom and sends debris flying everywhere which almost hits Isolde, but Gawain O'Neill is there to protect her, as we get to see her in all her muscly glory. Percival manages to protect everyone from that blast and states Perbard hasn't really done anything to make him dislike him so much. But for the fact that he is associated with King Arthur and Ironside, he is his enemy. Pergard is just happy to hear that Percival doesn't hate him, but Perio tells Percival that it's a bad idea to fight Pergard now since he has too much power, but Percival remains determined. Pergard likes that spunk and urges him to try and beat him. He launches a giant fireball at Percival, which Percival tries to slice, but he had forgotten that Pergard's flames are under his complete control, so anytime he cuts them, they will just split into more flames. To counter this, Percival uses his magic to suck the flames up, but he isn't strong enough to keep it contained as Pergard just raises the temperature until his magic burns through. Percival realizes he can't win and Pergard tells him there is no shame in losing. He has grown far stronger than before, so he has made good improvements. He still wants to take Percival so he can train him, but all of a sudden, his magic is snuffed out by Gawain. Pergard doesn't understand what just happened, but Gawain refuses to explain and just unleashes her magic next to him, making him retreat for the moment. Thanks to the golden aura, Percival realizes that this must be the Gawain they were looking for, and soon after Tristan arrives, having been drawn here by the commotion. Lancelot is here as well, so all four horsemen are united at last. Pelgard wasn't expecting to encounter all of them right here, but now that they have all come together, he asks what they plan to do now. 
Lancelot tells him that if he wishes to run away, then now would be the best time to do so, however, this statement gets Tristan all riled up since he can't believe Lancelot is actually giving the enemy a chance to escape. He says they have to defeat and capture him as their prisoner, but Lancelot doesn't agree since Pellebert came here just looking for a good fight, not to actually kill anyone. Still, Tristan asserts that it is their duty to capture him regardless. He turns to Gawain to get some backup on this, but her response is a little more than he was hoping for because she wants to kill Pellebert. And not because he is one of King Arthur's knights, but it's because he called her a little girl earlier. While they are disagreeing over what to do next, Percival walks up to Pellebert, who thinks he wishes to fight some more, but actually Percival simply wants to talk. He sheathes his sword and tells him that he doesn't hold any hate towards him. Unlike Ironside and King Arthur whom he hates very much, Pellebert hasn't done any evil stuff and even though he doesn't know much about him in the first place, he can tell that he isn't a bad guy. Earlier, he thought of Pellebert as an evil person. But now, he is no longer so sure of that. Pelbert asks if Percival is asking him to sever ties with King Arthur and join his side, and for a second, it looked like the talk no jutsu was effective, however. Pelbert just takes the opportunity while Percival's guard is down to yoink him off the ground and get out of there. Tristan tries to come to Percival's aid, but Pelbert tosses his shield at him to keep the distance between them before he calls back his mace and leaps into the air to ride away on said shield. As the others watch him escape, Tristan refuses to let him get away and brings out his wings to chase him. However, Pelbert had some extra tricks up his sleeve as he tosses a magic orb at Tristan, trapping him and the other horsemen in an inescapable perfect cube. In other words, all the people who could actually do something to help are now trapped, and we all know Donnie and the others aren't gonna be of any help whatsoever. As he rides away with Percival in town, Percival yells at him for tricking him back there, he acted like he was being convinced just so Percival would lower his guard and fall for his trap. Pelgard says he was convinced, but only convinced that Percival is a major pushover. However, that's something he likes about the kid, but saying that just makes Percival fight even harder. Back in the town square, Dunny kicks the barrier to see if that would do anything to help, but it does very little change the situation. This is the same thing that was used against Lancelot back in the forest, but back then, the only way it was removable was with another magic orb. They wonder if there really is no way to remove the barrier without one of those, but that is not the case. It can be removed normally, however, it will take an immense amount of force to pull something like that off. Inside the barrier, Tristan is beating himself up because he let Priscilla get kidnapped by Pelbert. He then turns to Lancelot and questions why he didn't use one of his attacks to strike him down as he was flying away. Lancelot calmly explains that if he did something like that, then he would probably take out Percival as well, so it wasn't really an option. And besides, as he was reading Pelbert's mind, he could tell that Percival's talk no jutsu was actually making him consider switching sides. In the meantime, Pelio says he will head back to the castle to get help for them however before he can do that, Gawain takes a look at the barrier and begins to chant a spell which instantly dispels it. Tristan doesn't understand what she just did, but that's not important right now as he needs to hurry and go after Percival. Once Tristan leaves, Lancelot reveals that he recognized what Gawain did as absolute cancel, so he asks who she really is. And the whole time, she's just standing there with such swagger that her middle name might as well be Himothy. While the others want to go after Percival as well, Lancelot tells them they should just leave that to Tristan, since they'll never be able to catch up on foot. But that doesn't apply to Gawain as she just teleports out of there. Tristan has just caught up to Pelvar as he was flying away, but then he notices something flying at him from the front. It is a sword, but not just any sword, as it is one that belongs to Himothy herself. She appears in front of Pelgard and declares that she will kill him for calling her a little girl back there. Pelgard tries to reason with her by saying she would kill Percival as well if she tried to take him down now, but she doesn't care in the slightest and might be a little crazy as well to boot. She slashes at Pelgard and nearly kills Percival as well, but at the last second, Pelgard tossed Percival aside to save him. However, he wasn't able to do the same for himself as Gawain's blade cut all the way through his chest. She was about to finish him off right there, but Percival couldn't just stand by and watch him be killed right before his eyes. So he rushes in and punches Gawain away before diving down to catch Pelbert. Once he is safely on the ground, Pelbert questions why he would go out of his way to save an enemy, but Percival could say the exact same thing about him since he went out of his way to push Percival out of danger earlier. Pelbert admits that he did it because he cares about Percival, but Percival just thinks he is being weird. Just then, Gawain descends from the sky, and upon locking eyes with Percival, the first thing she does is punt him. She has a major superiority complex, so Percival punching her back there was a great insult to her pride. However, her foot is planted so deeply in his stomach that he can't understand a word she just said. She then proceeds to backhand him away, intending to continue the beating. 
Tristan gets in between her and Percival for his own safety and tells her to stop. It's not right to attack an ally, but she argues that Percival protected an enemy, so it's perfectly fine for her to treat him like this, since he is now a traitor. Tristan isn't fooled by her statement, however, since he saw her try to kill Percival along with Pelbert, he knows something is seriously wrong with her morals. He heals Percival, and tries to get her to back down once more, saying friends should hurt each other. But that is where she corrects him. She is not his friend and quite frankly it disgusts her that he even considers himself to be on equal terms with her. She makes it clear to him that the only ones who can tell her what to do are those that are stronger than her. But since she is perfect in every way, that means there is no one strong enough to do that. And if he disagrees, then she urges him to put his swords to use to prove her wrong right now. Tristan considers it for a moment, but he ultimately states that his swords are not meant to be pointed at allies, even if they are being jerks. But all this profound maturity gets him as a bitch slap to the face as Gawain finds him very boring. In the time they were talking, Percival has gotten back up from the ground and yells at Gawain to apologize for hitting Tristan just now. He went through a lot to bring them together, so he doesn't deserve to be treated like that. Gawain directs her attention back at him and slowly walks him down before winding up a punch. But before Percival's face can get caved in, Pelbert steps in and blocks the attack, promising to tame this girl and show her who the real Himothy is. Meanwhile, back in town, the guards run around doing damage control while the Hoodiv figure slinks back into the alleyway. Percival's friends are all worried for his safety, but Lancelot tells them they won't go after him until something bad happens. He is intrigued to see what Percival can truly do when he is backed against a wall. Back with Percival, he tells Pelbard not to get involved because he is still injured from Gawain's earlier attack, but he thinks that makes it more fun since he has a handicap to make it fair for her. Besides, Pelio's magic that made him move weird has worn off now, so he should be back in good fighting shape. Gawain feels greatly insulted, so she charges up her golden flames and fills the immediate area with them, trying to roast Pelgard alive, but he is not weak enough for an attack like that to kill him, so he simply smashes her guts in with his mace through the flame. Gawain gets even angrier at this and leaps into the air before striking Pelgard repeatedly, however, all her strikes are being blocked, showing just how skilled Pelgard truly is. To him, all her attacks are too basic, so he is easily able to deflect one to the ground, which leaves her chin wide open for a mace to the face. Gawain gets uppercut so badly that she is sent into the sky and crashes down, leaving an imprint in the ground. Pelgard walks up to her limp body and praises her because she is indeed a strong. She possesses almost unlimited potential, yet she has still not learnt to control her abilities to the fullest yet. She is just letting her strength do all the heavy lifting instead of applying it skillfully. As she lay there on the ground with her title of Himothy official having been revoked, she listens as Pelbert berates her for growing complacent with the strength she possesses. If it had been anyone other than him she just fought, she would have been killed right in the spot. He tells her to admit she is weak and train hard from now on if she wants to live a long life. Gawain's anger is indescribable, but unlike with Percival, she knows she will just get her ass handed to her if she fights the real Himothy Pelbert. So she just pounds the ground in frustration and begins bawling her eyes out. It's a strange sight for Percival and Tristan to see the girl who beat them up so badly crying like a baby, but Pelbert doesn't hold it against her, and instead advises that she acknowledges that there is still a long way to go before she can claim to be the strongest. However, maturity is not something Gawain ever learned, so she's throwing a tantrum over losing to him instead. She's not as graceful of a loser as he thought, so he has lost interest and decides to take his leave for today. Unless Tristan plans to try and stop him, but Tristan says he has no intention of fighting an injured opponent, plus he did save Percival from being killed by Gawain, so he owes him a thanks for that. Pelbert appreciates the act of chivalry from him, so he calls for his flying shield and rides off into the sunset. As he leaves, he tells Percival that he hasn't given up on making him an apprentice yet, but Percival just smiles instead of getting angry. While flying away, Pelbert checks on the wound Gawain gave him and to his surprise, he finds that Percival used his magic to heal him while he was fighting, so has something to thank him for as well. Meanwhile, Percival still has to deal with the sobbing Gawain who refuses to accept that she lost to an injured old man and he is fed up with her already. He tries to tell her that losing once isn't the end of the world, but for her, it might as well be. Her grandpa and grandma told her she is the strongest in the world. So Tristan decides the best way to handle this is to give her a dose of copium. She was just a little off her game today, so if she fought Pelgard again, she would definitely win. Just like Gojo. After inhaling large amounts of copium, her pride has been restored, so she is ready to return to Leonis and conveniently leave out the part that she got beaten up. At least we know how Tristan managed to get Gawain to come here in the first place. She tries to reassert dominance on Percival by saying she will graciously forgive him for hitting her earlier, but that's not going to work on him after he has seen her cry like a baby on the floor. 
Back in Leonis, Lancelot can sense that Pelber has left the battlefield, but Percival is safe with Tristan, so everything is alright. The others are impressed he can sense all that from way over here, but just then, he senses weird magic over in the direction of the castle, so he gashes forward to go handle the situation. Back at the castle, the cloak people are cornered by the guards who say they won't be hurt so long as they answer their questions, but rather than cooperate, one dashed off to complete their mission, while the other handles the guards. And once she manages to revive the demon, the knights stand no chance whatsoever. The energy of the demons can be felt throughout the capital. Chaos Melascula and Chaos Galen have been reborn by the power of King Arthur so they may kill the seven deadly sins, as well as the four horsemen. Sixteen years ago, a war took place in the Kingdom of Britannia, and in that war, the most fierce battles took place between the seven deadly sins and the ten commandments of the demon king. Now two of those commandments have been revived by King Arthur. Even King Arthur's holy knights are having second thoughts about reviving such deadly monsters, but Arthur isn't worried because they have become his pawns to be used to secure a better future. And more importantly, their service here can be considered atonement for the mass murder they committed years ago. They will fight and sacrifice themselves if necessary, but I don't think that make up for their war crimes. The knights that are facing them have just learnt that they have been sent here by King Arthur, so they readies themselves to attack, however, none of their attacks manage to leave so much as a scratch, and with a single wave of his hand, Galen is able to cause a devastating shockwave. The knights take a look at the damage that was just done, and it looks like a line was cut through the entire town, but Galen assures them that he has not killed anyone. As long as you don't count holy knights and non-humans. This one knight realizes, Oh no, I'm a holy knight. And in that same moment, his body splits in two, along with several non-humans in the kingdom who got caught in the line of fire. Melaskula also takes out a couple of the holy knights before returning to Galen and discussing what they are doing here. They can't remember anything, but one thing Melaskula is sure of is that they must have somehow lost the battle against the seven deadly sins. If they lost, that must mean the deadly sins are still alive in this world. And if that is the case, then her anger might get the best of her and make her attack them recklessly. In the castle, Meliodas and Gilbo have just sensed the magical energy of the Ten Commandments, and he is certain that they must have been revived by King Arthur. Gilbo finds it odd that they went through all the trouble of appearing in the town, yet they have made no attempts to attack the castle. This leads him to believe that their attack may simply be a diversion to draw their attention away from their real goal. And Meliodas has his suspicions that their real goal may be to get to the prisoner that they are keeping underground. Just then, they realize that Camelot may be taking the initiative in this attack, because they are after the power of prophecy. In other words, their target is Bartra and his power of clairvoyance. Meliodas rushes to his bedroom so he can guard Bartra, if anything were to happen, but even if the commandments are only there as a decoy, without the seven deadly sins, there is no way anyone could ever defeat them. That may be true for normal knights, but Meliodas has faith that Percival and the gang will be able to handle this. Outside the Cayman walls, Tristan has just begun to sense the demonic aura coming from Galen and Melascula, and it is unlike anything he has ever felt before. Percival notices that Gawain's hands are trembling, so he grabs hold of her hand to calm her down, and although she may still be putting on the tough act, she appreciates his kind gesture and asks for both he and Tristan to accompany her in taking down the demon so she doesn't have to worry. Back in the kingdom, Galen is enjoying the time he has to torture the people until Meliodas ends up taking the bait and showing up. But rather than Meliodas, the one who appear are the Percival, Tristan, and Gawain who all teleport in together. Galen doesn't know who these kids are, but just from the scent of Gawain, he can tell that she is the same as Eskinor, although with slightly less chad in her genes. And with Tristan, Melascula can sense a combination of light and darkness magic born from the fusion of Meliodas and Elizabeth's magic. Lancelot then walks up and they can immediately tell from his magic that he is the child of Bon and the fairy girl. These two might want to consider working for Ancestry.com at this rate, but right now, they have to deal with the four knights of prophecy. Meanwhile, Arthur has a little monster acting as a drone to give him live coverage of the whole scene. He learns that Galen and Melascula are getting ready to fight, but their opponent isn't Meliodas as Arthur was expecting, rather, is the four knights of the apocalypse. The drone can't believe that the Knights of Prophecy are really just a bunch of kids, but upon further inspection, it is shocked to see that Gawain is among them. It is truly a surprise, since she is Arthur's niece, you would think he must be taking the betrayal hard. But on the contrary, he burst out laughing since the turn of events is quite ironic. Getting back to business as long as Leonis has Valtra and his clairvoyance on their side, they will always have important information and be one step ahead of him. So Arthur gets up to take some precautionary measures. Even though they know these kids aren't ordinary, they still aren't aware of just how powerful they are. So Galen and Melascula treat them as a joke. Galen expresses his sympathy to them from having to die, but he is going to enjoy every moment of their deaths, so he charges forward at them. 
He knows he hit two of them, but he has no idea where the other two have gone. In the air, Tristan is worried about Percival and Gawain since they got hit with Galen's strike, but he has his own problems to deal with as Malaskula appears behind him and seals him in her cage of darkness. The technique is a realm of darkness where the power of chaos will eat away at both your body and your mind, so she believes Tristan has been taken care of. Galen still wonders where Lancelot could have ran off to, but he didn't run away as he is standing right in front of him. He was about to take care of Galen, but Gawain came out of the rubble and yelled for Lancelot to back off since she will be taking care of Galen herself. Galen likes the spirit she is showing, so he walks up to her and unleashes a torrent of punches at her body, all of which she proceeds to eat like a five-course meal. At the same time, Melascula is surprised when Tristan manages to escape her prison of darkness by slicing through it with his sword. Once he is free, he tells her straight up that she and Galen will not be able to beat them because they are the hope of Britannia. And on the ground, Percival has just regained consciousness at the mention of hope. He gets up and thinks to himself how he would have died from a blow like that a few weeks ago, but now he is different, the thoughts and hopes of his friends give him the strength to fight. Galen continues throwing punches at Gawain while making fun of her for not fighting back even though she is so similar to Eskinar, but she doesn't enjoy being compared to the original goat, so she makes it clear that she is her own person and slashes Galen across the chest. However, although he was thrown back a bit, he still remains unharmed because his body has been strengthened by the power of chaos. He throws another punch at Gawain and this time she was not able to eat it, as she is thrown back and coughs up blood. She has no replacement for Eskinor as Galen knows firsthand how bad it feels to take a hit from his axe, and he is itching for a rematch with him. But then his memories become fuzzy again and he doesn't remember why he was fighting Eskinor in the first place. Lancelot recognizes that Galen was likely brainwashed to keep him in line, so the second he starts to recall a bit about his evil past, he hears Arthur's voice in his head and continues beating up Gawain. He knocks her into the air, follows her up just to knock her back to the ground. However, as he was coming after her again, she gets a great idea and teleports her sword to a position where Galen will be, and once she has done so, the sword appears lodged in his stomach. Although the power of chaos may prevent him from taking damage from the outside, it doesn't work if the sword is already inside the body. Gawain then teleports up to him and grabs the sword before using it to split his body down the middle. And as she does this, she declares herself as Gawain, the Lord of the Sun. She stands over Galen's cleaved body, but he still remains alive and continues to mock her, because an attack like that won't be enough to kill him permanently. However, as his body was reattaching itself, one of the mini percivals appears with a message. I am a nuke, and I'm about to do nuke things so back away. Galen didn't notice and heal with the mini Percival still inside him, so moments later he goes boom. Once the dust settles and Galen has been defeated, Percival comes down to check on the others, but he also kinda detonated a nuke with them still in range, so Gawain is really mad and starts chasing him around while Lancelot watches. Choosing to ignore Percival and Gawain's squabble, he turns his attention to Tristan who is still fighting Alaskula, and as the two clash in the air, Tristan urges her to surrender, but she has no intention of doing so. She casts another one of her spells, and as Tristan blocks with his sword, he realizes that one of the enchantments he had on it has been taken. The monster she summoned is able to eat his magic power, and even when he tried using holy magic, it was ineffective. She explains that this monstrosity has the soul of a demon and a goddess mixed together, so he is immune to the power of light and darkness. She was worried when she realized who Tristan's parents are, but it seems that his power isn't anywhere near what Elizabeth could use. Rather than being upset at the insult to his capabilities, Tristan is just excited to get the chance to talk about how awesome he thinks his mother is. Compared to her, he is an absolute novice, since his holly power can only heal wounds, but can't do anything about curses or disease. He's always wanted to hear more stories about the past of his mother, so he gets up close to Malaskula and asks her to begin story time. She's a demon and even she's freaked out by Tristan, but he really wants his story time. So when that monster tries to attack him, he casually kicks it down to the ground, where it lands on Gawain and gets incinerated in an instant. Now that the distraction is gone, Tristan still wants to hear stories of his mother from Malaskula. She tries telling him he looks nothing like his father to get him angry, but Tristan agrees with her on that as well. She is starting to get really irritated by how much fun Tristan seems to be having in this fight, but they get interrupted by this fairy that just randomly shows up. Tristan urges the fairy to leave before he ends up getting hurt, but the fairy points out that Malaskula is from the demon clan so she could be useful to them. She is unable to recall her origins due to Arthur's brainwashing, so she just tries to kill the fairy instead, and it looked like she managed to do it for a second, but moments later, the same fairy appears behind her. This was no ordinary fairy either, as upon descending, it reveals that it is actually Lancelot. 
He uses the fact that Melascula's brainwashing prevents her from thinking about anything involving the demon clan to weaken her, so by mentioning it, she gets a splitting headache and is subjected to constant subliminal messages to get her to keep her from thinking. And since she is a magic user, if she can't think clearly, then she won't be able to cast any more spells, nor will she be able to keep her shape, so Tristan should have an easier time fighting her now. As Melascula is no longer able to keep her shape, she ends up reverting to her true form of a giant snake. Everyone except Gawain is shocked, including Dunny, Nasins, and Anna, who have been relegated to side characters at this point. Melascula still can't think clearly, so Tristan is going to take the opportunity to take her out by using his full power. The Kingdom Manx are getting ready to fight, but before they can do anything, Tristan has already flown in and out of her gut several times. Even Gawain is shocked by the power he just exhibited. And with Melascula finally dead, the immediate threat to the Kingdom has been dealt with. Tristan doesn't like using the demon half of his peers, but Percival thought he was really cool just now. Meanwhile, Lancelot heads back over to the castle, because he can tell something is wrong there. This was the end of episode 21. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to not miss the next part.